En nombre del Ministerio de Justicia y Derechos Humanos, agradecemos su participación en el Foro Internacional Políticas Públicas y Principios Rectores, el primer Plan Nacional de Acción sobre Empresas y Derechos Humanos de Perú. Actividad que damos inicio al proceso de implementación del Plan Nacional de Acción sobre Empresas y Derechos Humanos 2021-2025. Aprobado Recording in progress. mediante decreto supremo número 009-2021-JUS, publicado en el diario oficial El Peruano el 11 de junio de 2021. Queremos expresar nuestro agradecimiento por su importante apoyo en la organización de este evento al proyecto Conducta Empresarial Responsable en América Latina y el Caribe, SALC, financiado por la Unión Europea y administrado por la Organización del Trabajo, la Oficina para América del Sur de la Alta Comisionada de las Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos y la Organización para la Cooperación y el Desarrollo Económicos. A las personas que deseen recibir constancia de participación, les recordamos que se requiere la asistencia al 90% de los dos días de desarrollo del foro la cual será registrada con las horas de ingreso y de salida a través del sistema de la plataforma. Asimismo, les comunicamos que este evento cuenta con traducción simultánea a los idiomas inglés, quechua y aguajún, que pueden ser activados desde este momento en el botón correspondiente del Zoom, ubicado en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla. De igual manera, disponemos... We also have a screen with a Peruvian Sign Language Interpreter, which can be selected if you wish. For this first day of the International Forum, we will have five moments. In the first place, the inaugural session. Second, a conference called Guiding Principles and National Public Policies. A third moment where we would have a panel, National Plans of Action and Coherence of Public Policies for a Responsible Business Conduct. Then the panel on Human Rights, Competitiveness and Productivity, Opportunities for Sustainable Development. And finally, we will have the third panel called Labor Rights and Public Policy on business, responsible business conduct, the role of unions. Each one of these panels will be followed by a session of questions and answers that our public can uh, relay. As a first act, uh, we will invite our Minister of Justice and Human Rights, uh, Eduardo Vega Luna, for his inaugural uh, speech. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. A very cordial uh, salutation to Mr. Diego Mellado, the ambassador of the European Union in Peru. Mr. Vinicius Carvalho, the director of the ILO for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Alan Jurgensen, the head of the Center of Organization for Cooperation and Economic Development for the Responsible Business Conduct. And Mr. Oscar Caipo, uh, leader of the National uh, Confederation of uh, Private Business in Peru. Ms. Uh, Carmela Cifuentes, uh, chair of uh, the uh, Conf National Confederation of uh, Labor in Peru. And Ms. Cuadros, a representative of the Platform of Civil Society on uh, Business and Human Rights. And uh, to the ambassadors uh, of uh, Germany, United Kingdom, uh, the Kingdom of uh, the uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, 
Sweden and uh, Switzerland and uh, the, to the representatives of the multi-action plan of uh, the human rights and business conduct 2021 and 2025 uh, to our distinguished representatives of the state sector, of the business sector, of the indigenous funds and uh, unions and international organizations and uh, international cooperation. To the panel members that are here with uh, us, uh, to the friends and uh, our, our friends that are participating in this event uh, from the country and abroad. It is an honor to present to the international community as well as the domestic community this national plan on uh, business and uh, human rights, 2021-2025, uh, uh, published on uh, the official gazette, which is the first one in Peru and the third in Latin America and the Pacific Alliance. This um, National Plan of Action is uh, the result of the firm willingness of everyone to have a tool that has been a long uh, work coming, an endeavor that uh, has participated with 132 institutions of the government, uh, private uh, companies, uh, the indigenous people, the syndicate, the unions, uh, the civil society, and international organization as well as uh, international cooperation. Operation. Thank you to all and each one of you and your institutions for the effort during and before the pandemic. This plan is presented in a certainly very complex moments in our country and makes a commitment of the government in the lining number five of the plan of human rights 2018-2021, which objective is to have a strategic alliance between the government, the businesses of all sizes and lines and sectors, and civil society to guarantee protection and respect for human rights in all business activities. The approval of this plan sets a very important moment in public policy for human rights in the country. As uh, for the first one, it incorporates uh, the business sector through a set of uh, collaborative actions and the social actors to promote a culture that is every time sounder on uh, the uh, matter of human rights on businesses. Uh, but it uh, goes beyond this. Uh, the process of uh, uh, preparation of this plan on the method of dialogue and uh, all the way th to the final document has been a clear demonstration of the maturity of the different actors and uh, the importance of uh, the dialogue as a sustainable development, a dialogue based on good faith and equality and inclusion on decentralization and uh, the sea search for consensus, a dialogue that uh, admits uh, the importance of uh, different uh, visions and different circumstances that are uh, processes on uh, the objective that is common, which is to guarantee human rights uh, through international standards. Uh, the discrepancies, which is also the opportunity to go and uh, uh, further the uh, links on uh, the brotherhood and uh, this uh, path uh, can help us uh, to uh, work in a collaboration in favor of uh, human rights. Uh, since the beginning, the National Plan of Action has been conceived as a tool that in which you have uh, to see the government efforts, the private efforts, and the civil society efforts to guarantee the quality of life of people linked uh, directly or indirectly to uh, business activities, especially those that are more vulnerable, such as women, uh, children, and uh, teenagers, uh, indigenous uh, people, and Afro-Peruvian uh, people, the LGBTQ uh, movement, uh, the uh, adults, uh, the elderly, and amongst others, uh, as uh, the signaled uh, by the uh, guiding principles of the United Nations, uh, the uh, guiding lines of OCDE, and uh, the 
the tripartite declaration of the principle of the multinational companies and social policy of the ILO. The due diligence in uh, human rights is uh, one of uh, the conditions of operations of all businesses undeniably linked to the generation of prosperity. And it is also a fundamental element of the business's plan because it allows them to obtain and to preserve an adequate relation with their environment, have opportunities of businesses that need a goodwill and trust and to track and preserve the productive labor and to access new markets and capitals, improve their capacity of innovation and acceptance of their products and services services, uh, amongst other advantages. Uh, that is, uh, there's a series of benefits uh, that will impact an improvement of their productivity and competitiveness and uh, a longer term of the sustainable development of Peru. As a government, as a society, we have uh, the ethical uh, requirement to have an economic uh, development with a real concrete direct impact and the improvement of life quality of all uh, citizens. Uh, the uh, economic development that to be useful cannot only be made on the numbers and the figures. It has also to be translated in a decent labor uh, dignified uh, remuneration uh, conditions on uh, labor and the disrespect of uh, diversity and fight against racism in uh, the labor relations and in uh, consumption and in uh, publicity. And in every time, a better protection of the environmental health of the harmonization between labor uh, work and family and uh, the the uh, a boarding and approach uh, to social conflict uh, and uh, to towards uh, the uh, native uh, organizations and to reach all this, the public policies under the focus of human rights, and a co coherent uh, work of the government in which each one of the sectors fulfills its role that can be assessed, corrected, and analyzed and updated, uh, placing always as a uh, objectivity and uh, the follow-up on human rights of the national plan, uh, the action uh, national plan, if it is a uh, correctly implemented is a very valuable tool to reach a human rights a culture in Peru that will involve all the public servants, businessmen and businesswomen of uh, the big, medium, small and micro businesses, workers and their unions, citizens, indigenous citizens, the civil society, organized civil society, and in general, all citizency. This is a very complex challenge, but it is unavoidable, especially now that we are about to come into the bicentennial of the independence of Peru. To help uh, to confront all this and to go into this approach, uh, we have seen uh, this plan uh, training, specialized training on all sectors uh, and a highlight of accompanying to the business uh, sector to, for the implementation and the voluntary and progressive report uh, of due diligence uh, to fortify the capacity of uh, businesses uh, to learn on uh, the uh, human rights. Uh, and uh, the national plan is also um, thinking about the business uh, activities and uh, their capacity building uh, to uh, fortify their conduct and integrity and fight against corruption to contribute to the diminishment of informality to adequate uh, the internal uh, standard uh, to uh, the international standards uh, guaranteed to the citizens uh, access and timely uh, ways of rep remedies. Uh, it is in total 97 action with uh, over 150 indicators uh, distributed in five uh, guidelines that are strategic and 13 goals that involve 21 and uh, 
duties of the executive with the support in the framework of the competencies of uh, the uh, judiciary, of the public ministry, uh, the uh, ombudsman, uh, the regional government, and other institutions. And as I said at the beginning, one of the most important uh, features of this national plan is that these actions, uh, although have uh, uh, to in the government uh, as uh, the major obligee. It's also connected uh, with the obligations that for their own uh, nature as uh, have the businesses uh, and the civil society in general and uh, what is uh, the human rights. The only way to advance in this road is to establish a strategic alliance amongst all actors. Uh, the timely uh, the, the timely allowance for those that are involved in this task to be able to be completely um, responsible for the act and uh, the uh, support that ha each one of you has given is unvaluable and has uh, been fundamental to give this first step. And I want to express our thanks uh, to all public servants and uh, ministers, ministries, uh, vice ministers, uh, um, general directors and managers and line managers that have participated in uh, the terms of uh, this uh, uh, and uh, the business sector represented by the president of CONFIEB, the representatives of the unions, uh, represented on this occasion by uh, Madam uh, Vice Chair of CGTP, the leaders uh, of uh, the uh, native uh, uh, peoples, uh, um, represented by the Chair of IDSF and uh, the Organization of Civil Society, and uh, the uh, Executive Director of uh, Cooperation and representative of the platform of uh, the Civil Society. I want to thank as well the support that was given by the work group of the United Nations on Business and Human Rights, the Office of the High Commissioner of United Nations for Human Rights, the International Organization of Labor, the Organization for Cooperation and Economic Development, and the European Union through a responsible business conduct for Latin America and the Caribbean side which has been a very important to guarantee a very a process that is adjusted to, to the international sentence and set upon a reality that is then uh, viable and allows us to have a ground on a, every time a stronger and a sturdier policy. I also thank the support of the embassies of uh, Germany, the Kingdom of uh, the Netherlands, uh, United Kingdom, Sweden and the Switzerland, whose experience and uh, on uh, technical assistance and financial aid has been very useful to build our own path. Also to friendly institutions such as uh, the Foundation Friedrich Eckbert, uh, the uh, Spanish uh, chambers and the NGOs uh, that have helped us on uh, the environmental health and uh, the Institute of uh, Anton University Antonio Ruiz de Montoya, the, the study of uh, the Universidad del Pacifico on Mining and uh, the Institute of uh, Democracy and Human Rights of the Pontifical University, Catholic University of I would like at this moment to invite you to see a video that we have prepared to give a summary of this collaboration work through which we have prepared the first action plan on business and human rights in Peru. Please go ahead. Desde enero de 2019, el gobierno de Perú through the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights has carried out the elaboration of the first national action plan of business and human rights. The objective of this plan is to incorporate the guiding principles of the United Nations on companies and human rights and other international standards in all the public policies of the country. And we strive to include the 
human rights in all the business activities. The National Action Plan has been a collaborative effort in which we have participated 132 institutions in the state, the business sector, indigenous peoples, unions, and civil society organizations with the valuable support of universities, international organisms, and international cooperations. The representatives of all of these institutions have participated through democratic and transparent dialogues in different work tables, uh, conversations, trainings, workshops, and regional and national public activities to share and delve into concepts on the responsible business conduct, sustainable development, and the prevention of social conflicts. The National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights has uh, uh, talk about 23 uh, topics on the diverse problems with special emphasis in vulnerable groups, transversal situations like informality, the crisis and COVID-19, protection of environments, and the uh, extractionary activities. These dialogue spaces between the participants have managed to get consensus and assume that the discrepancies there are also opportunities to build and implement strategic actions. And Based on this, the National Action Plan provides actions of training, monitoring, and um, liability actions where based on the standard, international standards and a strategic alliance between the different sectors and the general citizenship. Uh, within the framework of the Bicentennial in Peru, this National Action Plan on Human Rights and Companies 2021-2025 is a tool that provides important opportunities to strengthen public policies through the participation of all the actors, states, and socials, and a great opportunity to keep strengthening the culture of human rights in our country. As you can see, we have already taken the first steps to build uh, a multi-stakeholder strategy to be able to overcome the, strat the problems that have come through COVID-19, where we can only come out of this uh, together. No distinctions and having a cooperation and going over our differences and focusing on the type of country that we would like to build from now on and not leaving anyone behind. This uh, crisis of this magnitude makes us all understand that the economic reactivation needs to have a human content, that development only happens through justice, that the economy and the public policies are not an end in and of themselves, but a tool to serve the people. The National Action Plan is that. It's a tool for human rights and sustainable development of the country. And we want this tool to be useful, and that would depend on everyone, especially the state, but not just the state, but also the business sector and organized civil societies, unions, indigenous populations, and the citizens. And while we when we present this plan publicly, I would like to call upon everyone on behalf of the state to join all of our efforts of uh, businesses and civil society so that this uh, public management uh, tool can be alive, that it can feed from the coordinated effort of all the different sectors in the country of your work. And so that it's a dialogue, it's a tool that would allow us to build consensus that are more wide, based on the dignities of all people without any distinctions. That is also the aim of the international forum that we uh, start today that is uh, called the, Na the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights and Governing Principles and Guiding Principles. I thank for the participation of all of the panelists and the moderators, both in Peru and from abroad, and public and private and international public and private companies that will be here to share experiences and learnings from different enriching points of view. I am sure that the Bicentennial will find us with the necessary maturity to face this new challenge and that the next authorities of the country will know how to respect and value this effort and this tool that was built based on collaborative dialogue, which they should, uh, which should ensure an effective process of implementation. We hand over to the country this uh, national action plan on business and human rights with that hope and conviction. 
thank you everyone for your participation and i declare this international forum to be a uh, inaugurated we uh, thank the participation of the ministry minister of justice and human rights Vega. and coming up we will give the floor to mr diego mellado the ambassador of the european uh, union in peru Thank you, everyone. Good morning from Lima. Good afternoon to everyone who is here from Europe and other parts of the world. I would like first to say uh, to greet Mr. the Minister Eduardo Vega. It's always a pleasure to be here and sharing this virtual roundtable with you and above all working closely as we've always done with the Ministry of Justice to elaborate and launch this uh, action plan. I would also like to greet the presence of the Vice Minister and all of the representatives of our um, partners and everyone who has been working in this very important project that we have been supporting as the European Union from our product of uh, responsible business conduct. And I would like to thank the people from ILO, from the Office of the High Commissioner from the United Nations. And also, of course, a very welcome Greeting to the representatives of the uh, business uh, associations, CONFIEP unions, and all the original uh, indigenous populations, and all of the specialists that have been part of this. From the European Union, we have worked hand in hand with our European allies, our partners in the European Union, and Germany, in uh, the Netherlands, in Sweden, in other countries like Switzerland and United Kingdom. And of course, it's very important to keep working, to keep contributing to this, because what we are trying to do here, what we are seeing here in Peru is something that is also being done in Europe. We know, and I think that is something that we all share, and the minister has just touched upon this, there's an international consensus and a consensus in all of us, our societies and our markets, and the importance of bis uh, responsible business conduct and the importance of business and human rights. Nowadays, the economic model that we propose and that we all share basically with Peru and with the region from Europe is an economic model where social justice, where the respect to human rights and the respect to the environment, the protection of the environment, all of this is a part of the type of economic model and the business model that we would like to promote. Europe is a big uh, economic block. It's one of the biggest economic block in the country. We are also the biggest import and export block. We are one great market for Peru and for the Peruvian companies. We are a great market for other uh, companies in the world. And that also has um, attraction and a model for other markets that are also important for Peru. And the message from Europe is that we would like to promote the business models, the business conducts that are respectful of uh, human rights. So this action plan is going to help to articulate policies that are coherent, solid, coming from Peru, who work hand in hand with the business partners, with the unions and the um, indigenous population, so that the framework in, within the Peruvian businesses work is a human rights and environmental framework. And from Europe, we still would like our market to be more favorable. And the consumers are also demanding, are also very faithful to the companies that are respectful of the human rights. And in Europe, we are now elaborating new uh, legislations and new guidelines so that it's mandatory for companies to follow human rights. Those companies that have international value chains where the responsibilities that they have is, has a direct impact on consumers and the consumers can see it. So I think it is important for companies like Peruvian companies and other, other com uh, countries that look at the European region. And now because we are trying to reactivate our economy because of the pandemic, everyone has gone into an economic crisis. And now we are trying to recover and relaunch the uh, European uh, economy and the European market can be a model for the Peruvian um, people and everybody. And we want this model to be open, open to businesses from other countries and a model that would favor, obviously, 
green cooperation, ecological uh, cooperation, and from those countries that promote human rights and business. So we are looking at an economic reality that is very concrete and we would like to be a driver of this reality. We would like to work with countries like Peru, who are now launching and implementing this um, action plan on business and human rights. So from this project and the future uh, European cooperation that we are now redesigning for the next period from 2021 to 27, we will still uh, supporting funds, experience, and the ability of our companies, of our specialists, of our member states to continue supporting initiatives like the one today. That is why I'm happy to be here today and to work alongside these important partners, international partners that reflect a shared vision and a consensus like the one that we were talking about. Thank you very much. And uh, you are, and I love this event. We would like to thank the participation of uh, Mr. Diego Mellado. And coming up, we would like to present a video with the greetings of the uh, ambassadors of Germany, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Sweden, and Switzerland, who have provided an important support to the elaboration process of this national action plan on business and human rights. The adoption of this plan on business and human rights is a great success. I would uh, like to congratulate everyone responsible, especially from the Ministry of Justice. Our experts have been working closely with you during the last few years in focusing and leading this legislation. So it was just a matter of time that the German parliament had approved um, a week ago the called uh, supply chain law, which is a law that has the same objective. But the emphasis here is different because of the globalization of the nature of the German companies. The products that we buy and that we use every day are a result of a more globalized world. That is why they go through a long route, a very intense route. And it is clear that globalized supply chains of these products are vulnerable to abuse, human rights abuses and different uh, type of abuses. Uh, child labor laws or organized discrimination to forced labor, which presents and front to the situations of human rights in uh, different uh, production countries. Which is why the National Action Plan in Peru complements the German legislations as in, in an exemplary fla fashion. Uh, it pleases us that Germany and Peru can complement as partners in this case, as we are already doing it in other global challenges like the fight against climate change. It is a great result in a year in which we celebrate 150 years of diplomatic relationships. I wish all participants that the conference is a success. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the opportunity to uh, talk to you today to say hello from the uh, Netherlands, the approval of the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. From the ambassador, uh, from the embassy of the Netherlands, we have closely followed this process of elaboration as part of our actions and our initiatives to promote the responsible business conduct. And also, today, we are very pleased with the implementation of this instrument. We congratulate the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights for this next step in the effective protection of human rights in Peru. I would like to congratulate the Peruvian government for the recent approval of the first national action plan on business and human rights. 
I would like to highlight the focus adopted by the Ministry of Justice in the elaboration of this plan that has managed to gather the voices of all Peruvians from different geographies and different sectors, from indigenous people and to civil organizations and unions and also business associations and state institutions. In the current um, context, to be able to bid bridges between these different uh, sectors and to be able to find um, common goals, it's the only way to create a more unified society that is more prosperous. In the United Kingdom, in my country, we consider respect for human rights as the basis for the development of any type of economic activity. This is why my country was the first one in the world to elaborate a national action plan on business and human rights. Our objective in the United Kingdom was to create a business community that was responsible and contributed to a sustainable economic growth and inclusive and to generate better well, social well-being to the society. In, the United, in my country, we still have a long road ahead of us, but the plan has been a very important tool in order to achieve pro progress. This is why it's, uh, we are very proud to share our experiences and lessons learned with our colleagues here in Peru. And through that experience, to also learn from you. In the next few years, the United Kingdom will stay here and support the Peru in different uh, sections to protect and promote human rights and also the inclusive economic and the exclusive and sustainable economic growth. Finally, I would like to congratulate the government and all the different involved sectors involved in this. Let's keep moving forward together. From the Embassy of uh, Sweden in Lima, I would like to congratulate this plan, National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. As an embassy, we have focused follow this process closely. We've been part of the uh, multi-stakeholder roundtable. We've talked about dialogues and international experience. And we have also supported the development of a report on the, the rights of LGBTQ people, which is all extremely important for the process and the elaboration of the plan. The government of Sweden has expressed expressed an expectation that the Swedish businesses work sustainably and responsibly working for human rights, gender equality, good labor conditions, environment, weather, and the fight against corruption. Uh, many Swedish uh, businesses have been able to innovate and become more competitive out in the world. In this framework in Peru, the embassy and the, bis and the Swedish businesses have signed an integrity pact. Sweden reaffirms its commitment as an ally to keep working alongside you when these fundamental processes like this one, which sets the advances in order to create more prosperous and equi equitable societies. For the Embassy of Sweden has been a great pro uh, honor to work in this for this uh, successful continuing of Peru. Thank you. Good luck. It's a great pleasure for Switzerland that the National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights has been approved and we are very pleased to congratulate all of the participants for this milestone in the history of human rights in Peru. The Swiss Embassy in Peru has contributed to this action plan since the beginning and we have contributed to shape this important um, instrument, for example, through financing of studies. Switzerland supports this national action plan because uh, we are interested in establishing a dialogue that is constructive between businesses and the state in order to find uh, pragmatic solutions in order to protect and guarantee human rights. This plan doesn't only uh, establish certain responsibility on businesses, but also new possibilities to contribute to the economic process, environmental process, and social processes in Peru with a, in alignment of the 2030 Agenda in the United Nations for Sustainable Development.
in order to have a successful collaboration in the future, Switzerland, along with other countries who are part of this problem, progress, would like to continue supporting Peru, providing technical support and expertise, international expertise. Again, I would like to congratulate everyone for this joint effort and the positive impact that this type of goals will bring to Peru. Thank you. Coming up, we would like to hand the floor to Mr. Oscar Caipo, the president of the National Confederation of Private Business Institutions in Peru. Mr. Eduardo Vega Luna, Minister of Justice and Human Rights, and Mr. Diego Mellado Pascua, Ambassador of the European Union in Peru. Mr. Vinicius Carvalho Pinheiro, Director of uh, the International Labor Organization for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Alan Leppert Jorgensen, Head of the OCDE Center for Responsible Conduct. Ms. Carmela Cifuentes Inestrosa, Vice Chair of uh, the General Confederation of uh, Workers of Peru, Mr. Lizardo Cauper Peso. Chair of the Interethnical Association of Development of the Province of Jungle, Ms. Julia Cuadros Faya, Executive Director of Cooperation on the Platform of a Civil Society on Business and Human Rights. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassadors of uh, Germany, uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, uh, Sweden, and Switzerland uh, that have given a message. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a representative of all the uh, civil society organizations uh, and uh, the succession of inauguration and also the multi-acting uh, round table of uh, business and human rights. Ladies and gentlemen participating, good morning. In the first place, on behalf of CONFIEP, I would like to express all our solidarity of those affected and families of the dead, of the a very strong seism of yesterday at the night. And I would like to start the felicity. Uh, congratulating uh, this event uh, that is presenting the first action plan on business and human rights of Peru. And also uh, in congratulating you for leading during these two years, uh, the process of uh, preparation of this plan uh, based on uh, the guiding principles of uh, businesses and rights of uh, the United Nations. I think we think that this very important step uh, gives a predictability on actions and uh, accountability of uh, both uh, the government and the companies, uh, the companies and the businesses in Peru, especially those uh, that work on the formal site, independently of their legal condition, size, uh, property structure or sector, have a very positive contribution to the economic progress of our country. Allow me to express uh, uh, to quote uh, Mr. Antonio Eterres, General Secretary of uh, the United Nations, uh, that said at an international summit on the sector, the role of uh, the private business uh, that uh, uh, without the private sector, we would not have innovation nor the capacity needed uh, to discover new markets, uh, products or services. Uh, and uh, we couldn't have enough uh, labor, uh, jobs uh, to have uh, dynamic and stable societies. It is in the sense that the private uh, formal sector in Peru represented by CONFIEP, that the groups, uh, 22 representative guilds on 20 on 12 sectors, understand and value that we have the responsibility of respecting human rights uh, on our activities and uh, businesses. 
But we also know that there are some opportunities for improvement and uh, to uh, face the, the different challenges in this matter. For this reason, the companies are implementing uh, some frameworks that allow to prevent these elements that may be related to their operations or through their uh, chains of supplies. Uh, to advance and contribute to consolidate a culture to human rights in Peru, we have participated very actively in the, the process of preparation of the National Action Plan through our uh, National um, Committee on uh, Businesses and Human Rights Institutional Space, in which we uh, uh, further the best practices and the training moments and other initiatives are promoted jointly with different strategic allies. We have contributed in a proposing way and the construction of the national plan, action plan, and we presented our position on matter of business and human rights in where we state the need to have the following approaches to see the informality, the fight against corruption, the promotion of a policy of prevention for conflict, promote arbitration centers, conciliation and mediation centers, further the strength, the institutional strengthening in water management, confront the legal activities amongst other relevant topics. We acknowledge that the process of preparation of the National Action Plan was complex and was the long two-year process in which we found issues of high consensus and others in which we were not always agreeable on the different parts of actors. For example, from the list that we stated on uh, what we just said, half of these were not considered in the, the final text of uh, the uh, action plan. However, that is not an impediment for the uh, business sector to ratify that we will promote uh, this uh, national plan that has been published and uh, actively participate on its implementation. We expect that the coordination spaces are made uh, to implement the plan would allow us uh, to have a uh, transparent and reflexive and respectful uh, discussion on the different and diverse uh, positions to this stage, we will contribute with effective mechanisms that will promote the respect of fundamental rights, such as the subscription of voluntary principles, codes of ethics and conduct, and the channels for denunciation and allegations and others. We consider fundamental to continue in advance of these aspects that are a very useful tool that will allow us to articulate the different initiatives that, that we are developing from the private sector, amongst which we have a program that we have been working with the technical assistance of IDB that elevates the acting of CONFIEP and its guilds based on the international standards, OCDE, United Nations, amongst others, in topics such as anti-corruption, managing interest, conflicts of interest, free competition, transparency, protection of the environment, and human rights. To conclude on speaking about human rights, we have to express uh, this importance of the reality that is uh, for Peruvians, which is the informal activity. It is fundamental to tackle this informality. As we all know, this is a space where human rights are, are violated uh, and the high degree of informality have uh, shown us uh, what we are as country, only the fourth part of uh, the occupied uh, uh, a population have a formal contract, that is 10 million of Peruvians do not have labor rights or social protection. So that is, they are in vulnerability situation. We think that micro and small businesses that represent 99% of the companies of the businesses in Peru are a key to formalize the economy. And for this, the 
major companies are committed to have a more active role to help the micro and small businesses to grow and to transit towards formality, for example, through, through uh, productive chains. And to attack informality, we have to understand its problem and tackle the causes. So that is uh, the excessive uh, red tape and corruption that exists, the high cost of being formal versus the benefits of uh, being formal, and uh, to um, the control that happens with formality. We have to help uh, with effective dialogues, some solutions uh, for more independent businesses and workers uh, could uh, transit uh, progressively towards formalities and uh, that thus uh, uh, take into account the human rights of uh, unprotected uh, labor. I would like to share the uh, council that I have, uh, I preside has acknowledged uh, that our organization has to have a more active and closer uh, role with the needs of Peruvians. And this is our next uh, purpose, uh, placing Peru forwards and the uh, people in the center. We have to articulate with the government and the society to generate development and well-being. Together with this purpose uh, from CONFIEP, we reiterate our commitment with a responsible business behavior that acts with principles and values with the highest standards of ethics, transparency, and integrity, stewarding uh, the, um, the environment and uh, promoting uh, the sustainable development. Uh, the action plan that is uh, presented today is uh, set that the importance of a dialogue of seeking agreements and to go forward in the fundamental topics of uh, our national agenda. We have to do more of these dialogue exercises and seeking consensus to be able to advance and uh, further our progress in society. Thank you very much. We thank the participation of Mr. Kaipo. And we will have now, um, give, we will now give the floor to Madam Carmela Cifuentes Inostrosa, Vice President of uh, the General Confedera Confederation of uh, Workers of Peru. Thank you very much and a good morning. Mr. Eduardo Vega, Minister of Justice and Human Rights. Mr. Vice Minister of Justice and Human Rights. Mr. Representative of the International Organization, Labor Organization. Ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors. Mr. Representative of CONFIEP. Dignified uh, international and domestic representatives, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the different institutions uh, here today with us. Uh, friends from uh, the unions that are here. My salutation from the union central of uh, my country in Peru, especially from the National Council of uh, the um, General Confederation of Workers of Peru. We salute uh, this uh, first plan, national plan on action on business and human rights. And we will deal specifically with my salutation, class uh, salutation to the topics of uh, businesses and human rights. Sustainable development, social inclusion, competitiveness, and sustainable investment. As a representative of a union, I have to tackle a very important point, which is the right to a job, which is a fundamental and essential right to be able to realize other human rights, which is an inseparable part of a human activity. A job is so important in the life of people that in the, the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 23, it speaks about it. But we also need to know what is the reality of this important human right that, that I just shared with you. Around 730 million workers in the world, world live in poverty. That is, their income 
outcome is not enough to grant them the needed conditions to have them go off the poverty threshold. So the right to the job as all the human rights is not something that we have a completed. It has some challenges that have to be fought in my country and throughout the world. And I want to solidarize uh, today with a great pandemic uh, that is uh, uh, going through our country and also the world in general. My solidarity with the workers that have uh, fallen uh, this pandemic or that are infected. Many of us, uh, these uh, workers are going through that process but in this way my in my country the right to have a job is a tool that we have to build daily a better future for everyone and it is this uh, that i sell it, uh, participation in uh, this sector through the different responsibilities uh, but it is also important to clarify and what is the business part? And I will repeat, literally, what what Drucker and Misbeck says. Great uh, studies on management and business so that they say that the obligation of experience of management is to make decisions and take actions uh, for the organization to contribute to the well being and interest of the society and itself. So, the center of this uh, human right of work the person, the human being, not as a merchandise not as a collaborator, but as a worker. And for that, we have continued working on different spaces and fora uh, and acknowledging point number 14, agreement number 14 of the national agreement, the create decentralized uh, creation of uh, jobs in concordance with the national, regional, and local action plans, development plans, something that we still do not have, which is a policy of the national agreement. It is a dialogue agreement, and this dialogue should commit to improve the quality of labor with uh, income and adequate conditions and access to social security to allow a dignified life uh, with a micro business and small and medium business and access to markets, credits, and new technologies and not to have a gap in income. So that is what we have. We need the true laws and it is through this forum and through all this uh, sequence and process that uh, we have uh, seen a marvelous laws. But my great country is that. I have very good laws, very good uh, policies, but not implemented. So uh, despite the fact that the business acknowledged the, the business activities have uh, to understand and follow all collective uh, jobs, uh, labor um, uh, agreements, including uh, strikes and uh, collective bargain, the same in informality topics that we have not created, but the whole process in which uh, the social dialogue that is today almost inexistent, and that is a fundamental step towards uh, the labor right uh, to be acknowledged as such. And most of the companies, we do not have it. Maybe in some, not all, but in most of them, we have not seen it. We have a Ministry of Labor that does not apply a true social dialogue. It is a dialogue, dialogue that does not fulfill anything, so we can't talk, call it a social dialogue. And uh, the social uh, responsibility of businesses, uh, that the businesses have to participate actively in the sustainable uh, development of our country, and thus listening to the words of the CONFIEP representative, we think that a responsibility is to act 
activate that is sustainable and sustained development of our country. We do not want perfect suspension. So that has created a huge informality. We do not want collective uh, downsizes. Uh, we want a true social dialogue in which workers, uh, business people, get together and commit and engage themselves for the well-being of our country. So we commit ourselves and we are in the whole process of continuing in the fight, in the struggle and the discussion of public policies as we are doing in this forum, as we're doing it in the national agreement. And we would like to be in the Ministry of Labor through the, the space called Confluence of interpretation and interrelation in the labor ministry, but we do not have it. However, we have to continue exercising the right to discuss legally and legitimately, but also the right to protest and mobilization with proposals. We have designated representatives and assistant to this forum at international and domestic level, we have proposal, we have agendas in which we do not only demand in the streets, but also to we propose, and that propositions are to reduce the vulnerability of the human rights for the businesses to respect fully the human rights in Peru. Within the corresponding ministry with a social justice, that is the Justice Ministry of uh, Ju the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. Let's go to our process to access to the social justice and our commitment of our union to build in this bicentennial a new person in a new world. This is the commitment of our, our union to continue the dialogue, but with the respect of this dignified work, uh, which is not something that is a, a gift, but it is a human right. Our salutation, our thanks, and the commitment to continue in working and to continue discussing, to continue debating, but not antagonizing. Thank you, representatives here in this forum. We would like to thank the participation of uh, Ma'am Carmen Cifuentes, we welcome uh, Mr. Lizardo. Uh, we we say that this Mr. Lizardo Cooper Peso from the Interethnic Association of Development of the Peruvian uh, Jungle has had connectivity problems and will not be able to participate in this forum. So we will now hand the floor to uh, Ms. Julia Cuadros Falla, the Executive Director of the Civil Society Cooperación and a representative of the Platform for Civil Societies on Business and Human Rights. Good morning, everyone. Um, warm greetings from the Platform of Civil Societies on Business and Human Rights. We are part of a wider cooperation than along with other organizations of indigenous populations of um, district societies and platforms like the platform for uh, the people affected by toxic metals, then um, environmental defense uh, organizations in different parts of the country like Shanghai and others. <clears throat> the approval of this national action plan on business and human rights is the result of a process of participatory construction for a tool that needs to build some Get to close the gaps between public policies in our countries and the international framework on business and human rights and sustainable development, social inclusion, competitiveness, social investments, and sustainable investment, and the fight against corruption that hurts us so much. In a sense, we would like to highlight the participation of unions and indigenous populations and the civil society in this process that have allowed the state and the companies to recognize officially the negative impacts of human rights that have been generated by business activities in popular in communities in towns and in consumers and in workers 
in the environmental defenders and other stakeholders. And we would like to highlight that through um, a multi-stakeholder dialogue, we have been able to implement this plan to a public policy that would reduce the human rights violations but from the business sector. And we would like to also say, um, greet the Ministry of Justice that has been leading this process with a lot of um, future vision and the business people that have been committed to take the necessary steps to advance towards the integral respect of human rights. We would also uh, like to mention some vacuum, some absences, some, some voice that we have found in the, in the plan from indigenous people and indigenous communities. We show that only one of the proposed topics has been incorporated in the national plan. And during the process, we have been able to incorporate mechanisms that will allow to protect the right to territory, to food sovereignty, institutionality. We think that we still have a long way to go. We think this national action plan is a great first step in that road. The indigenous jurisdiction hasn't been taken into account for the people that have been, uh, whose rights have been violated. And the previous uh, consults and the mechanisms of environmental management, like the uh, environmental impact studies, are still not at the level of international standard. We would like it that during the implementation process of this plan, we could incorporate these points. We know that this plan is not set in stone, that we can still improve on it. And uh, we need to take into account these uh, vacuums, and it's very important to do so. The reparations to indigenous people and the community, communities that have been affected by, for example, toxic metals and other metals is a demand that even though we've made progress in having some public policy line, uh, alignments and that is still not being really applied. We need to strengthen uh, capabilities in health uh, education where these problems are presented, but from the national government, from the Ministry of Health, they also need to make that effort. When it comes to labor, my uh, my colleague Carmen Cifuentes also knows that the workers uh, are, not, are, not very, are very discouraged that we don't present the or recognize the public policies and the company policies that are still below the international standards and that it's necessary and urgent to uh, look at all of the collective labor rights, including uh, strikes and collective negotiations, the informality topic, not looking at it just from the existence of an informal sector of the economy, but also what is the responsibility of the formal sector to this informality. And I think that would be a very important step to move forward in the rights of all of the workers, wherever they may be. So in that way, we would be able to move forward and change those business practices that our project is um, presenting as a road of responsible business conduct. The human rights institutions that have formed part of these platforms and other organizations uh, throughout this entire process have shown the need to adopt the right methodology and the use of indicators that would actually reveal or evidence those changes in business conduct to reduce that um, violation of rights and to reduce the asymmetries and the existing gaps in the rights. Now that we see the implementation of this plan, we will, we will continue to highlight this, we will continue to be involved in this process because we believe that business development is only going to be sustainable if we com comprehensively incorporate the international demands in complying with and respecting human rights. We need this National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights to be a, a substantial part of a new state architecture of public policies that need to be continued 
develop continually in our country so that both international companies and national companies can respect those rights, especially taking into account that the National Action Plan is not an end in and of itself, but it's a means in order to get development and the business development to be sustainable and not to be done above the rights of these people. And that is why we think that the approved national plan needs to be taken as a starting point in order to keep improving the processes in the short and the medium term to eliminate the stigmatization and criminalizations of the defenders of human rights to recognize their labor in defense and protection of rights and to generate mechanisms to prevent and transform uh, conflicts to activate, for example, the, pro the defense protocol of defenders that uh, the Ministry of Justice has been asked us to work on, and we think that is key. We need to speed that up. We need to implement different tools or mechanisms that would allow the defenders to be protected. The implementation of this national action plan uh, also demands to enhance the empowering the participation of civil society organizations in executing and follow-up, both in strategic actions and also in complying with the objectives. And that comes from giving the right information from national to regional and vice versa, from local and regional to national, and also presenting the pilot experiences of dialogue that we have developed in the last two years in when, while constructing this plan, and that has been done in different parts of the country and the need to be um, a pilot exercise, a di an exercise in dialogue between the state, the different business sectors, and the social actors and the populations in the territories. This plan also demands that we approve a new law that establishes the mandatory uh, due diligence. We have the example of the countries in Europe that are approving laws on due diligence, and we think that that is um, possible. We hope that with the new Congress that we will be able to see that here in Peru so that they can be involved in business companies and the, both the supply and value chains with uh, to identify the, the chains, what are the violations of rights and to plant uh, to propose this issue of due diligence in order to avoid activities that have been historically infringed on the rights and that they continue to do so and that they need uh, we need to talk about the reparations of the case and finally from civil society uh, for all of these years we've been we're defending human rights and we are reaffirming our commitment to keep both discussing about public policies to highlight what it needs to be highlighted and also to exercise our right to mobilization and protest with proposals, as we have said, to reduce the infringement of human rights and that in this bicentennial year we can be on the right path to respect fully the human rights uh, from companies and that our state can guarantee that exercise and that um, respect to human rights. Thank you very much. We thank the participation of uh, Ms. Julia Cuadros. And now we would like to hand the floor over to Mr. Vinicius Pineda, who is the director of the office from the International Labor Organizations for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Minister Eduardo Vega, Minister of Justice and Human Rights in Peru, I would like to say hello to all of the participants of this important event. Mr. Ambassador Diego Miguel from the European Union, also from the international uh, community and all the partners that support this initiative, my colleagues from OCDE and from all the different associations. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you and all of my distinguished representative of business organizations and work organizations and civil societies and indigenous people. This is a historic moment for Peruvians, 
who present a milestone that we hope is an example for other Latin American countries. As Mr. Robert, the minister said, the plan, the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights is a tool uh, that is going to serve people. And that it needs to happen in the next few months because in the next few months, we're all going to be working in re rebuilding post-pandemic. And from the ILO, we propose that this has to be focused on people and jobs. For the ILO, it has been a pleasure to see the, in June 11th, the Supreme Decree that approves this first National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights in the country, not only because of what it means for Peru, but also for the rest of America, of Latin America, because we've been following closely the elaboration of this tool that's been supported by ILO, from MacNutz, OCDE, and all of the different uh, business con responsible business conduct countries in Latin America and the Caribbean with the support of the European Union. This is a third country in the region that publishes this type of plan, and Peru moves to a part of the groups uh, of countries that work differently on human rights and businesses, and that is essential for the... Um, that will have a great impact on the life of millions of people who have lost their jobs, who have suffered from this pandemic. Uh, 26 million jobs have been lost in Latin America and the Caribbean. And in order to rebuild these uh, business markets, we need to implement the new flaws that have been highlighted because of this pandemic. We have the start of an operation. We have preliminary results, but are very promising. But this impact between work and businesses has been catastrophic. And in the road to recovery is very long. Uh, a few days ago, last week, representatives from 181 countries of uh, different governments and workers joined in the International World Labor Conference and unanimously adopted a calling to declare uh, COVID-19 uh, to create prior priority to um, create new jobs in companies so that everyone and that it can tackle the different inequalities that are presented. This national action plan with, for, for as long as we're here can be a key document for people who would like to increase their labors. Um, for the ILO, it's important that one of the strategic actions of this plan shows the need to drive the ratification and implementation of many different international agreements from the ILO, and we think that is the basis to increase decent work and to be able to implement this work. And this is when this plan is going to be presented as an institution. The 187 agreement, for example, on safe security and safety at work, it's very important and it's a part of the response to COVID and international agreements like 97 and 143, which are related to militant workers and the one about equality and treatment and social um, securities. And that is very important for Peru. And it's important to take into account when you have so many millions of people in the country and also to enhance the uh, participation of the agreement of work, of labor, and to strengthen the organization of uh, business and compl complying with the, norm, uh, with the standards. And that's critical and that's fundamental to drive the economic um, uh, function of this country. And it's a key environment to for social responsibility and to increase productivity and other things that those are things that I wanted to highlight the promotion of cultures and unions as the defenders of human rights, as Madam Carmen Sofosti Mastrosa mentioned. It's one uh, fundamental element for the uh, generalization for to generate work, and that's also why. Uh, we talk about the governing principles or the guiding principles of human rights and this proposal of strengthening of previous council, et cetera, is a topic that the indigenous people are also very interested in based on the agreement of 169 in the ILO and it's something that is fundamental for the future of the country. And finally, I would also like to highlight the need to elevate the minimum age to incorporate work to 15 years old and to eliminate any type of uh, minor uh, dangerous labor. And that is something that is important that Peru is doing, not only just Peru, but also when it comes to the international community. And ILO obviously is, is available to support you in everything that is necessary to do. So I would also like to highlight or to 
reflect a little bit on the process and not just the result that's important, but also the process of uh, the elaboration of this plan was very important as well from the ILO. We are committed, as, as mentioned, between the states and the unions to strengthen the respect to human rights in the companies to improve competitive, competitiveness and productivity and also sustainable development. We think that Peru has provided an example in the region, not only with this plan, but also uh, to open and sustainable dialogue, a process that was very wide with the participation of 132 different entities, and it was constructed in a participatory way and in consensus, including indigenous peoples and uh, unions and civil society and business associations. In this process, it was important to design this plan, but it, what's most important is the implementation of this plan. And in order to do so, we will continue to support you. Thank you very much. We would like to thank Mr. Vinicius Pinedo. And finally, we give the floor to Mr. Alan Jorgensen, head of the Center of Organization for the Cooperation and Economic Development for Responsible Business Conduct. Thank you. Greetings, uh, Minister Luna, uh, distinguished representatives uh, of the government of Peru, uh, European Union, international agencies, uh, the ILO, civil society. Really, the loss of organizaciones nativas y participantes es un privilegio a nombre de la OCDE por ver los congratular. Developing uh, the national action plan. Um, both for the country, uh, but also as an important signal for the region and indeed uh, globally. Um, the meeting today and the process in developing the National Action Plan uh, shows that uh, responsible business conduct is truly a multi-stakeholder effort, that uh, dialogue across uh, all of society and, and including all actors is, is both uh, important as part of uh, the process but it's also an important uh, end result in its own right. Um, we look forward to working with, with all of you as we now look to implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, responsible business conduct uh, concept for the OECD is about putting people and planet at the center of uh, economic development and cooperation. Um, we need a uh, vibrant business societies in order to create jobs, to develop human capital, to distribute wealth and... and ...de desarrollo y para poder bien distribuido tanto el desarrollo como la tecnología, la transferencia de conocimientos y de habilidades. Y sabemos que todos estos beneficios no pueden ser tomados o por, como algo dado, sino que el crecimiento de la economía y el impacto sostenible es, depende de la calidad de los negocios y no solamente de la cantidad del negocio. Por eso es que la OSD y también los países no OSD como el Perú en años previos han adoptado algunos estándares esenciales sobre la conducta empresarial responsable, donde las compañías esperan ser maximizadas su, con, su construcción y cooperación en los esfuerzos de llegar a cabo un los uh, impactos negativos de sus propias horas, operaciones y de sus uh, cadenas de abastecimiento. En este aspecto, el plan de negocios va a tener un gran impacto en el panorama. Primero, ayudando a identificar las necesidades y las áreas en las que se tenían que reforzar las capacidades de las uh, negocios uh, de mejorar su conducta empresarial responsable y también para uh, poder disminuir los impactos negativos uh, de uh, las uh, uh, conductas uh, no responsables y tener también un marco más coherente, más sólido de políticas, uh, tanto en los estándares medioambientales y de derechos humanos, uh, que es también para incentivar estas uh, mejores uh, políticas. Uh, nosotros estamos muy orgullosos de ver al Perú, de tomar en serio y de hacer estos uh, estándares uh, 
Alianza Internacionales de Conducta Empresarial Responsable, integrarse entre todo su marco de políticas uh, sociales. Estamos nosotros en el 2021. Hace 10 años las Naciones Unidas y la OSD han pavimentado el camino para estos nuevos estándares que nos dan estas herramientas tan importantes para construir economías más serias, más profundas, tomando en cuenta mucho más fuertemente tanto los derechos humanos como las conductas empresariales responsables. Hoy estamos revisando estos estándares de los logros hechos y también estamos a poniendo prioridades en el movimiento hacia adelante de todos estos planes eh, en todas partes y sobre todo en Latinoamérica para poder capitalizar sobre estos estándares importantes en el mismo tiempo que enfocándonos en uh, el trabajo contra la informalidad contra la prote con, hacia la protección de los derechos humanos empresariales y la uh, lucha contra los cambios climáticos uh, y el uh, problema del medio ambiente. Nosotros somos, damos la bienvenida a esta eh, política en el Perú, pero también tenemos que uh, resaltar el des, el, la importancia que tiene este eh, trabajo en el gobierno, en todas estas prácticas de debida diligencia y de compras, adquisiciones. Y en este punto quisiéramos también uh, subrayar que el Perú ha incluido varios de los hallazgos y recomendaciones que han hecho las revisiones de, de políticas de la OCDE para la conducta empresarial responsable y los han incluido en el proyecto, lo cual refleja el compromiso del gobierno en promover a las políticas que lleven a una conducta empresarial responsable para poder tener prácticas responsables de negocios y reforzar en esta forma la implementación de los estándares internacionales, incluyendo los lineamientos de la OSD, también para poder conversarse, convertirse en parte de este grupo de países que se sigue y se eh, dirige sobre este grupo de principios y políticas eh, para la Uh, conducta empresarial responsable, que es uh, para poder promover los dos uh, principios uh, y trabajar y enfocarse en uh, los uh, posibles no cumplimientos de las empresas y dar uh, con también el remedio para poder um, tener una responsabilidad y una relación con las empresas que, re, que fortalezca y establezca esta conducta empresarial responsable en todos los estándares para las diferentes agencias gubernamentales en sus diferentes y específicos sectores. También le damos la bienvenida al interés expresado, expresado por el gobierno del Perú y su compromiso para llevar a cabo una revisión de pares de la OCDE en el 2022, un proceso llevado a cabo ya por instituciones hermanas de su país. También me gustaría decir que la emisión de este plan de acción en el Perú es tan importante como sea posible en el contexto de la crisis del COVID-19 constante ahora en un trabajo que sea sostenible, inclusivo y resiliente. Sabemos que la adopción de los estándares de conducta responsable para las empresas es un factor clave para ayudar a la resiliencia en la crisis, la resistencia y asegurar que tenemos una mejor y mayor contribución en construir un país que una economía más inclusiva y más sostenible. Esta implementación es crucial para los avances en esta dirección. 
Así que hacia adelante, señores y damas y caballeros y señores ministros, es, estamos, damos la bienvenida al Plan de Acción Nacional en esta importante agenda en la implementación de dicho plan. Y a nombre de la OCDE concluiré deseándole unas discusiones y un trabajo muy fructífero en este momento. Muchísimas gracias. Participation. We reiterate our thank uh, for the participation to Mr. Minister of uh, Justice and uh, Human Rights and uh, to the representatives of the European Union, European Union, CONFIEP, and the Confederation of Workers of Peru, uh, civil society, on uh, businesses and human rights, uh, on uh, the international organization of uh, labor organization. And we will now have. Uh, our conference uh, in charge of the regional uh, representative of uh, the High Commissioner of the United Nations uh, for Human Rights, uh, Javier Amen. Can you hear me? Uh, good morning. Yes, Mr. Mena, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, a little uh, technical issue. A plan on the business and the human rights in Peru through this uh, cooperation on uh, the uh, responsible conduct in Latin America and the Caribbean. It is clear the leadership of Peru whose adoption was recommended on the periodic universal examination and the group of uh, the United Nations on Human Rights after the visit in July 2017, appreciating also the multiple efforts uh, and uh, for the government uh, to set uh, the basis of dialogue uh, during the different parts and to ensure that all voices are heard and taken into account. I can not only stop, uh, I cannot stop mentioning all the commitment of the agents uh, and its openness uh, uh, for dialogue, especially to the indigenous and Afro-descending uh, representatives uh, to the organizations of women and LGBTQI uh, persons and uh, the disability persons, uh, representatives of uh, the international and uh, migrating uh, workers of academia, and of course, representative of uh, the uh, entrepreneurial associations and private sector of the country. I have also known on the more than 420 different activities that have taken place in the last years, and the 130 uh, actors that have a roundtable of multi-actors to perform the uh, National Cooperation Action Plan. It has not been easy for each one of you, taking into account the different uh, interests and standpoints that probably exist, in which are some of the pandemics of COVID-19. The National Plan processes uh, has allowed that act agents that the national plan has allowed that actors that think differently and that had never been sitting in the same uh, table listen to each other understand each other and respect their differences and uh, this context of human rights and sustainable development are the language that articulate all these differences i imagine that given the diversity of our societies the structural challenges of the country and the huge challenges that we have in different dimensions not all will be satisfied with the results some would uh, probably think that there was still need some action and the others would not feel to include the due diligence in their business conduct, but through the different principles of reaching the human rights that we celebrate at the national plan today, because in this, we have three basic affirmations that we need to prevent and mitigate and remediate the negative impacts of private businesses on human rights, and that can only be possible 
or if nobody is behind in the development agenda. The government has a major responsibility to guarantee the respect of human rights in the context of the business activities. The Peruvian authorities are called to take action and exercise their leadership with example. Under this paradigm, the businesses are actors of development that should act in continuous alliance with the public officials, the defend the ombudsman, the civil society, and the uh, deed representative, and also the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, as well as the standards that are taken by the International Standards of Human Rights, offer a common language for all parties interested, especially in the very challenging context of the country. These standards are more important now that we are advancing in the controlling the pandemic. And we have measures of recovery and uh, economic uh, reactivation. People must be the center of the economic and business uh, response to eradicate prior inequalities and to respond to the negative effects of pandemic. I am very pleased to know that the National Plan acknowledged many of the observations and recommendations of the international organization and takes into consideration the observation expressed by the United Nations agencies. And I also wanted to uh, appreciate uh, the international commitments in the sustainable development and human rights in the same policy that reinforces the coherence of policy, uh, policy not only national, but also internationally. Allow me to sub underline the adoption of uh, the action plan, importance uh, for the crisis of human rights generated by COVID-19. The pandemic has generated a unprecedented crisis in uh, the uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, business environment. I am very uh, glad that the plan acknowledged uh, many actions that are led to uh, better tackle the improvements after the pandemic and to protect a decent labor of workers as well as uh, the different uh, groups that have served or received the negative impact of COVID. And uh, this uh, goes towards uh, the social protection as the national United Nations have access uh, that, that, that these uh, businesses have to go beyond what is as always uh, to, to recover better than before. And the framework of human rights uh, give us a uh, keys uh, to achieve this objective. I appreciate the, side, the companies that are here because they are located uh, to the right side of the history. The National Plan of uh, Peru in line on principles with the Agenda 2030 promotes the exercise on the businesses of due diligence on uh, human rights as a tool to identify, prevent, uh, mitigate, and respond to the negative impacts on people. This element is absolutely key and requires to acknowledge uh, the legacy of uh, the uh, structural in exclusion and to write the daily, the work, the, the path towards a social transformation. It is possible that you have uh, uh, heard about the rapid proliferation and the discussion internationally and the progress are given in uh, the uh, framework on due diligence, uh, mandatory that is now give, uh, been done, done in the European Union and their member states that I'm sure will have an impact on the way in which you do business in Latin America and the agree commercial agreements are that require every time a more frequently due diligence framework. It is obvious that we have a paradigm in terms of uh, responsible business conduct. And I am happy to see on uh, that on uh, the actions identified in the national plan of the Peruvian government is setting the basis for the business in Peru to confront these changes, uh, the mechanisms on the follow-up of due 
intelligence that gives a certain number of actions to reinforce the um, business conduct and to respond to the challenges that appear continuously if the businesses are disconnected on due diligence and do not demand the guarantee of the government there we will have an even huger uh, challenge uh, but in this way the uh, businesses uh, if they don't take human rights within their proce procedures would lose legitimacy before their investor their commercial uh, trade uh, associates and the populations with which they interact allow me to congratulate the 17 ministers that are committed in uh, uh, different actions of the plan, uh, national plan, and especially to the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights and the commitment of uh, the uh, President of the Republic for its approval. The uh, human rights is uh, very important for many government entities uh, with competence, competencies uh, relative to the conduct of businesses. Uh, the uh, human rights is concerned uh, to all uh, the ministries that have approved uh, this instrument. In this sense, the plan is that, for example, for the region in which many ministries that traditionally did not look into the human rights are now identifying it as part of their role in society. I call upon uh, to have this interministerial coordination to be sustained and reinforced and uh, gather also to a business agreement and the involvement of all these ministries are relevant of the executive is a key to achieve an effective implementation of the national plan. The exp international experience shows us that it is important to have an institutional process that is broad enough to have an uh, competencies and uh, the factors that are in charge of uh, the uh, reparation of the re remedies of, of violations and the ministry, public ministry and the judiciary and the co controller's office. And equally, the Congress should also develop a standards and laws that would uh, um, give a framework that is coherent, that would ensure the prevention and respect to human rights by private actors. Now, to guarantee the continuity of the progress throughout the implementation and update of the plan, national plan, we must to guarantee the active participation and periodical participation of all those uh, stakeholders, including uh, the groups uh, that are represented and uh, the vulnerable um, groups uh, that would be uh, um, centered in uh, the uh, groups that are most uh, in, uh, impacted by the business activities. It is fundamental to generate spaces that would establish and maintain the trust of the actors of the process and that people would be the uh, individuals that are product, uh, the, the actors of their own development and be heard on the activity, economic activities on their uh, land. The uh, action plan has a, a policy that is evolving to build up on the practice and the needs that will come up. I I encourage all the sectors are here to follow very closely the implementation of the plan and to the government to ensure the call of uh, different and uh, periodical meetings and transparency on how the uh, things are implemented and their, their scope and results. And before finishing, I would uh, like to salute and uh, appreciate that the indigenous groups that are dialogue in the government uh, to have a consultation that is uh, prior and uh, free and well informed to the representatives of uh, the group that have uh, defending the space, uh, the civic space uh, despite um, the exp exposure to uh, the uh, victims that have uh, sat with the businesses and the government uh, trusting that they're participation, despite the complexity, can uh, mean an improvement to the uh, Peruvian society and to the pl planet itself. Today, it's a day to celebrate that the dialogue is possible and that we have a map, a roadmap uh, that to prevent many of the abuses of human rights uh, on what are uh, business activities. I hope that the new government will retake this uh, engagement as the, this administration did, and I would like to reinforce uh, the importance of the 
role of each one of you to guarantee that what we have achieved until now will be continued in the future. Allow me to reiterate our uh, willingness uh, to support uh, the implementation and the follow-up of the agenda and the human rights and uh, crucial agenda for the future of the country. We hope that the next administration would be engaged in the participation of the accountability and the mutual respect, understanding good laws and checks and balances. Thank you very much for your attention. We would like to thank the participation of Mr. Javier Mena. Before we start with the, the first uh, panel, we would like to show you this following video where we explain the important work that this project of business, responsible business conduct has in Latin America and the Caribbean to promote the responsible business conduct in Peru and in other countries of the region. Almost two years after the start of the activities, the project Responsible Business Conduct in Latin America and the Caribbean, the CEDAR project, has supported governments, businesses, employers and workers organizations, and civil society actors of uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil to carry out initiatives that aim to place human rights, including the rights of workers as well as the planet, at the center of business activities. Facilitating spaces for dialogue and exchange of experiences so that governments can promote public policies on responsible business conduct, including national action plans on business and human rights, of strengthening of remedy mechanisms. Panama has a national plan for social responsibility and human rights uh, to position ourselves as a more inclusive, more competitive, and more sustainable country. We hope to officially launch an action plan in March 2021, generating proposals and methodologies for participation of society, as well as new topics that must be incorporated in the second version of the plan. Regarding uh, businesses and human rights, Colombia in 2015 approved the first version of the plan. We were committed to developing the second version. Uh, it was ready to go, but because of the pandemic, we decided to review the draft. And that's why we created a social dialogue that we called Together We Make It Possible. The great possibility is that the international framework on business and human rights contributes significantly to improving people's quality of life. Ecuador will begin this year with the development of a national action plan on business and human rights. These efforts seek to promote respect for human rights, labor rights, childhood rights, and indigenous rights, gender considerations, and environmental protection, fostering due diligence that has become the fundamental and essential behavior that is expected from any responsible business. In addition, the project is providing support and advice to strengthen the national contact points for responsible business conduct. Businesses in the region have made significant efforts to identify risks, to be more transparent, and to commit to due diligent efforts in the field of human rights. The recognition and respect of human rights has to be at the level of business strategy. I believe that is the role that we have to fulfill. <clears throat> the largest companies supporting the smallest companies, creating value chains and support chains so that we, we can have services, activities, and accessories necessary for the overall satisfaction. The RBCLAC project has raised awareness of the concerns and challenges faced by civil society actors, including indigenous peoples, local communities, and workers. Regarding the adverse effects of business activities on human rights, we demand the full participation of indigenous peoples in identifying the impacts of business projects 
these companies must have clear policies that prohibit attacks on defenders of the land. The project has also served as catalyst to encourage joint responses that allow post-COVID-19 reconstruction for the region, creating spaces such as the Fifth Regional Forum on Business and Human Rights for Latin America and the Caribbean. The pandemic has exposed deep and disturbing inequalities such as systemic discrimination that is present in all of our societies. And it is not acceptable to return to that state. We have a duty and at the same time a great opportunity to rebuild better. Respect for human rights and decent labor must be central to these efforts. And together we must seize this opportunity. If this current situation presents unprecedented challenges, some of you have mentioned, it also presents an opportunity to rebuild a better, more inclusive, and more resilient future. Resilience The RBCLAC project, part of the great commitment of the European Nature, ILO, OECD, and OHCHR to promote human rights, decent work, and sustainable development. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. We will now start with the first panel that has been titled National Action Plans and a coherence on national uh, public policies. And we would like to hand the floor to General Director of Human Rights from the Ministry of Justice of Peru, Edgardo Rodriguez Gomez, who will moderate this panel. We will now hand the floor over to the General Director. Thank you very much, good morning. We would like to start this panel with national action plans and coherence on public policies on business and human rights. In this panel, we will have a participation of three international uh, presenters who have a wide knowledge of the implementation of national plans in business and human rights. And this is an agenda that the Peruvian state is starting, and the Peruvian state needs to move forward with um, the development and the experiences that have already been developed. We have Froquia Bule, who is the manager of the project of responsible business conduct for Latin America and the Caribbean for the Organization for the Cooperation and Economic Development. And we have a we would like to welcome her. We also have Humberto Cantu Rivera, the executive director of the Institute of Human Rights and Companies in uh, Monterrey, in University of Monterrey in Mexico. And also Mr. Olga Dreisaitl, who is a sub chief of the Department of Com Business and Human Rights of the Ministry of Foreign Relations in Germany. I would like to thank you for your participation here with us today. And we have had some experience throughout this entire process together with all of you. I would like to start this reflection in this panel, responding, uh, answering some questions that we have uh, addressed specifically to you based on your international experience in order to get some, uh, shed some light uh, on the coherence of public policies that have based of the uh, guiding principles of human rights and business con responsible business conduct. So, uh, Froki would like to pose the first question based on the work that the project on responsible business conduct in Latin America that is carried out in, in the Caribbean. Based on the recent Latin American experience, what best practices can be uh, taken into account by Peru to strengthen the coherence and the responsible business conduct policies, specifically taking into account the role of the national contact point? Humberto, from your condition as an expert, an international expert on standards of business and human rights, we would like to pose a question based on the comparative uh, experience. What are the main limitations of the governing principles, of the guiding principles to improve the political policies in business and human rights? In
We have to go to this model as a guideline uh, from the experience of your country. Based what on the experience been, uh, of the your country, what has been impact. the experience on the country to develop this public, a responsible public policy? And what can Peru do to guarantee in the future an efficient uh, state based on the uh, mandatory law on due diligence and for business due diligence? We would like to develop this a panel and start with the responses to these questions that we have presented in uh, three different stages. First, the first round, we would like uh, Frau Hitu, Humberto, and Olger to, in that order, for eight minutes, offer the responses. Then we will have a second round that is going to be a little bit more uh, brief, that we will have a question based on the uh, participants virtually here today in this event. And that question, we would like to uh, have a, a three-minute response. And then in the third round, we would like to ask some final um, words uh, based on what we will discuss today. Then as a moderator, in a few minutes, uh, I would like to highlight the key ideas that our in, in panelists bring me today based on the ideas that will help the Peruvian state and starting the implementation of the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. We would like to start and we ask uh, Franji to re respond to the question that we have posed. Effort. It is a signal of uh, the commitment of Peru with uh, a responsible agenda, not only of the government, but also the organization, top civil society, unions, and uh, indigenous peoples, as we heard in uh, the opening session. Uh, this achievement is even more notable on uh, the crisis of uh, COVID-19, and uh, then uh, it is important uh, that uh, the answers is uh, uh, being able to generate a higher capacity of recovery on the long term and a stronger contribution to the sustainable scenario. In this sense, it is also important to uh, sp uh, speak about the explicit uh, mention of the plan that is a framework to concrete uh, but it public policies uh, to implement on uh, the standards and instruments on responsible uh, conduct. It is also very well aligned by the government, taken, taken by the government and adhering on the OECD uh, and uh, to the different uh, recommendations uh, for the uh, due diligence lines uh, from the OECD. We would like also to stress uh, that uh, the study of uh, public uh, uh, conduct uh, policies on uh, responsible context uh, that gave us a very important uh, contribution to the plan and help that all the different recommendations and good practice of other countries are reflected in this plan. And I would like to highlight that Peru was the first uh, country that uh, requested this kind of study, which reflects uh, the willingness of uh, uh, facing uh, the, the challenges uh, from other uh, public policies and uh, different uh, studies in Mexico, Brazil, Ecuador, and Costa Rica now as uh, this is a moment to celebrate, and it is an important achievement. It is also an opportunity to reflect on the, the requirement or the need of uh, implement this plan the best way. It is only be alive and significant for the country, uh, its people, the environment and society, if it is implemented in an effective way. There are too many action plans that are national and with very good intention, but that are only on the paper, and we are all here to avoid that this will happen again. And uh, to the question and the challenges and the opportunities, I would like uh, to leave on the tables a couple of messages of the OCED that we uh, find that is key on uh, the challenges. domains, uh, the participation of the stakeholders, the cooperation of the government, and the due diligence. And the first place we have heard a lot of uh, 
The stakeholders uh, participation and especially in the process, exhaustive process of consultation with companies businesses, civil society, unions, and indigenous people have been clear to guarantee not only uh, to, uh, the uh, uh, acceptance of the policy, but also the commitment of uh, all the stakeholders in this process. So this is a key opportunity, but it's also a challenge, a fundamental challenge for the implementation. It will be essential to maintain this uh, uh, there's a driving effort on uh, the stakeholders and uh, uh, interest uh, to guarantee an effective implementation. Second point is that uh, to uh, the government issue, one of the main challenges of uh, the uh, responsible business uh, agenda and uh, that we want on the OCD is that it's not under one ministry alone, but that it would be in the uh, scope of different institutions and areas that are different and to speak with one voice to the companies and offer adequate accompaniment and uh, to show with example it is implement it is important that to give a continuous and effective co governmental leadership on what is uh, trade investment and uh, to have a coherence of these policies the plan includes uh, number of objectives to reinforce uh, the model of uh, public uh, hiring and to uh, improve uh, the economic uh, uh, and uh, the management of uh, government and or state-owned companies. And uh, these uh, is a crucial point for the future of the plan uh, that I would leave on the table. And finally, leave on the table as well the due diligence. Uh, the, in terms of uh, coherence of public policies, uh, we also have to speak about inclusion in a plan of a strategic access for the promotion and design of a due diligence uh, procedures uh, that take into account the articulation, the coordination with other entities such as the Labor Ministry to adopt actions and measures uh, that would help to making implementations of the due diligence. At a world level, we see that implementation of due diligence for the business responsible counters is central in the agenda of a responsible entrepreneurial business responsible conduct. And as we have heard, there are some regulations that are increasingly and binding on the con European countries that have an impact on uh, Peruvian businesses that export or want to export to those markets uh, uh, or by the link of whether uh, their uh, chain of supply, but that still have a lot to do to have a practical and effective implementation on the companies that operate from and uh, in Peru, as it has been uh, demonstrated in an, a recent uh, survey of uh, OECD, it has been uh, stated that in Peru, 40% of uh, the companies that have been surveyed in Peru have uh, a risk assessment as part of a due diligence in uh, their supply chain for their providers and commercial partners. And it is said that, that this percentage is uh, still very lower for the SMEs, that is only 9% of SMEs that are always adopt a due diligence process of when they identify risks. And uh, it is also important to consider the informal sector in Peru in this context. However, the active construction of uh, this uh, building of these uh, capacities is uh, one of the key objectives to uh, qualify Peru as a safe place uh, for trade and investment. Peru is very aware of these three challenges and opportunities, and it is very clearly stated in the plan. And to finish this first round of questions from OECD, we want to express our interest and continue with the support and the assistance to the country in this path towards the implementation of the plan. Thank you very much. Edgardo, thank you. Thank you to Federico for the invitation to this space and congratulations to the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights for the leadership in this process and the government and the Peruvian societies because it's an important step to take not only in the countries but also for Latin America. 
the environment was a little bit more complex, obviously, because of what has happened in the basically last two years and also the political crisis of the countries. So it's an even bigger achievement that this national um, action plan has been implemented on human rights and business. Based on the question that was posed, I would like to briefly talk about the uh, political uh, problem because it's important to look at the two streams that we see. We see the horizontal stream that also refers to coherence between ministries where the human rights issues not only correspond, like Javier was mentioning, to the ministries of human rights of justice or foreign um, relations, but also all of the other ministries that are linked directly or indirectly with the private sector based on these uh, regulatory functions or from promoting uh, commerce, for example. And on the other side, we see the political coherence. We have a vertical stream where we talk about coordination between ministries where the uh, obligations of human rights can not only be reflected within the within the country, which is what happened in, based on the implementation of a plan of that type, but also uh, outwards with commercial negotiations on foreign investment. And I see that the biggest challenge that we can see in the countries and generally in the country that we see in national action plans is to find a right balance between economic development on one hand and the protection of human rights and the environment, especially because building cap capabilities is not automatic. And in many times it requires norm uh, guidelines reforms and organic laws that would facilitate the implementation of organizations by different ministries. I would also like to highlight some opportunities and challenges that I find in this first version, in this first draft of the National Action Plan in Peru. And I would like to start with opportunities where I see three different uh, levels of opportunities. First is in regulation, and then in building of cap capabilities. And third, when it comes to tackling different economic issues and industrial sectors specifically. When we talk about regulations, I observed in a very positive way that there's an evaluation proposal of uh, regulation based on due diligence in human rights. Why is that important? Frauke was uh, mentioning that I, I greet her also very warmly. It's important because for Latin America, in order to have uh, guiding the regulations in human rights is not is something that's the same as what happens in Europe because of the different realities that we have in our societies. And I think that the fact that it's the first action plan in the region that tackles this dimension that is a very important call in the reflection for the region about what does due diligence mean in Latin America. This first step that we are taking or that you are taking is going to be important to lead the efforts regionally. And I think that it, it, it poses a very intense debate on the interested parties about what is due diligence, how do we translate the recommendations of, man of risk management that we talked about to a regulatory framework with legal, political, and social characteristics that are very specific. And then when it comes to the regulatory framework is to clarify the scope of the penal responsibility of the companies for what is their crimes, business crimes or to human rights. The Peruvian uh, legal system does contemplate that uh, it would be important to have a clarification, and it provides a more global debate on what is financial resp business responsibility and how does that evolve both in the civil society, that's due diligence, and then we have administrative and legal and penal issues that also are important to understand and to clarify. And the third point when it comes to regulation that I think is also very relevant, is that we propose the existence of these um, commissions that are going to be review legal mechanisms on reparations, which is the first thing that I see, the first time that I see it in a national plan, following the recommendations of a project of access of uh, remediation processes from uh, OCDE. And I think it's important to have these revisions and from the legislator when we talk about what I was, what Frauke was mentioning, of the economic role of the state. That is where we can find great value and that can really support to move forward in this topic. When it comes to building cap capabilities, I think it's also important that this call to unify public policy is based on the guiding principles and talks about the horizontal political uh, coherence that I was mentioning, capabilities and uh, uh, 
training of public um, services so that it can help implement this national plan. And also, and this is something that I would like to particularly highlight, that we have seen cases of this in Europe, and it has been criticized, to provide technical assistance to companies on due diligence and different topics based on responsible business conduct, including the defenders of human rights. I think it's an important role that hasn't been tackled as specifically in other countries that have adopted these action plans. And it's a very significant step for companies to know in more detail what are the expectations of the government on their functions on that. And also the um, sector guides is also important. And I think we need to take it a little bit step forward. What are the impact assessments of these sectors that are priorities where we identify risks in order to uh, make visible what are the risks in the sector. And I think that will help that topic. And then when we talked about tackling different economic sectors and industries and the impacts on human rights, I think that another pos positive development is referring uh, publicity and marketing that we were talking about in Colombia a few days ago, a few years ago, also in Mexico. And it's a very wide project, for example, where UNICEF has a very, um, has been, is way down the road. And it's something that needs to be delicately tackled with that perspective of public health, the issue of uh, the binding companies to human rights with actions and climate change. This is another very important topic that can show the uniformity and political coherence, or it can also show how difficult it is sometimes to, to conciliate both agendas. And when we talk about the diligence in public companies, which is also very important, we need to lead with by example. The first step is for the state to take the measures in their environment as an economic factor to show about what is it, what they are willing to do. I think that is the test that we have to look at to look at the political will in this issue. The public um, tendering process is also very important. And in Peru, the private security companies and their role in that thing, those five areas, I think um, there's going to be a very good, uh, it's going to improve that in the, in the common, in the dialogue. The first is the political continuity of this project, especially as a shared responsibility, because it's not just about state, it's about civil society, unions, and the private sector to participate and demand the new government to continue implementing this project. That is a very important issue to that cannot just be limited to this public administration to improve the access to justice. In Peru, there are some important sentences that are very relevant in including in prevention and due diligence. It's important to reinforce or strengthen that knowledge. And any proposal in the action plan to train the legal sector, and that's also very welcome, and also to keep the essence of this process. And I think it's something that needs to be congratulated, this uh, multi-stakeholder space, but to include proactively the private sector. We heard some messages this, this morning about the, the, the private sector is very important in this issue. And I would like to call upon not just political coherence, but also business coherence between discourse and preventative actions. Thank you for your invitation. And I will be here for the second round of Q&A. Thank you very much, Umberto. We would like to welcome um, Olga Dreisaitl, who is here with us today. Um, we, will, we wanted to pose a question to Olga that was related to his work in Germany with companies, uh, business and human rights. We know that's the subject of the Department of Business and Human Rights in the Ministry of Foreign Relations and uh, Foreign Affairs in Germany. And we would like you to respond in eight minutes to the following question. And then we would like to uh, make um, a few questions from the public that we have today of the participants uh, that are going to be responding in, in, in three minutes. And finally, some uh, final uh, reflection. So in eight minutes, we, will, we pose this question to Olga. Based on your experience in your country, what has been the impact on the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights in Germany? to develop public policies of business, uh, responsible business conduct, and what could Peru do to guarantee in the future an efficient status and implementing a mandatory law and due diligence for businesses? That is the question, Ogre. Thank you very much for being here with us today. See? 
Ok, perfecto. Bueno, eh, mis saludos desde Berlín esta tarde, desde los que estamos en Europa. Es un gran honor para mí estar aquí. Muchas gracias por la invitación para poder contribuir a este panel y a esta conferencia tan importante. Y estoy muy agradecido de que el gobierno del Perú le haya dado una opción a Alemania a tener un papel en este evento, en este nuevo plan de acción de eh, y derechos humanos, sobre empresas y derechos humanos, y queremos empezar a decir que nosotros estamos abiertos a todo el involucramiento entre Alemania y Perú en temas de derechos humanos, y queremos seguir ahondando en esta cooperación en la fase de implementación de ese plan nacional de acción, y quiero también felicitar a Perú, tanto al gobierno como a todos los actores involucrados en el desarrollo de este plan nacional de acción, desde nuestro punto de vista, este es un gran logro. Y también les quiero asegurar que de acuerdo a lo que yo he estado leyendo aquí en Berlín, el Plan Nacional de Acción es un plan, una agenda de política muy profesional y que está completamente alineado a los estándares de políticas internacionales. Y ahorita estamos empezando en nuestra revisión alemana de nuestro plan de acción nacional. Y creo que este plan de acción nacional de Perú es algo que nosotros también vamos a estar mirando para poder inspirarnos en ello. Es, un, es muy positivo que Perú haya buscado vínculos con eh, organizaciones internacionales y otros países para poder desarrollar este plan y asegurarse que hay un estándar internacional en este plan. Y eso es eh, realmente un hito y un estándar. Eh, yo me invitaron para hablar un poquito sobre el Plan de, Nacional de Acción, el proceso de Alemania. Quiero primero eh, disculparme de que no lo puedo decir en español. Eh, simplemente mi español no es lo suficientemente bien y van a sufrir un poquito con mi español. Entonces, por favor, eh, acepten mi inglés y mi traducción. Como ya ustedes saben, Alemania empezó este viaje en la, interpretación, en la implementación de este plan en el 2014. Nos llevó dos años poder tener un plan nacional de acción final y fueron dos años muy difíciles, dos años en los que tomamos diferentes eh, recursos aquí en Alemania. Y también en este punto, en Alemania, no éramos los líderes en esta área. Y entonces tuvimos que invertir muchos recursos en los últimos años para poder mejorar nuestro desempeño en la forma en que nosotros lidiamos con este tema. Y luego cuando empezamos a discutir, a desarrollar este Plan Nacional de Acción, fueron discusiones muy controversiales y muy intensas, tanto dentro como fuera del gobierno. Y honestamente eh, siguen siendo controversiales estas discusiones hasta el día de hoy. Eh, lo que quiero decir, el primer punto, es eh, implementar los eh, principios de las Naciones Unidas sobre los derechos humanos es un esfuerzo continuo y de alguna manera nunca se termina y nunca debería terminarse porque defender los derechos humanos es algo que no se puede lidiar en un documento o no se puede resolver en un ejercicio. Pero tener un plan nacional de acción es un muy buen punto de partida para cualquier esfuerzo futuro. Y ahora que estoy revisando esto, Alemania ha llegado a un punto, ha avanzado mucho en estos últimos años y Hemos tenido, nuestro plan nacional de acción ha tenido una función muy principal en eso, un rol. Eh, primero porque la protección y el respeto de los derechos humanos en las actividades empresariales ha sido mm, importante en nuestras políticas de gobierno, está incluido en nuestras relaciones exteriores. Como ustedes saben, yo soy representante del Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores. Y esto sucedió porque el Plan Nacional de Acción Alemán nos presentó una plataforma que nos permitía tener un diálogo estructurado sobre dónde tenemos que actuar más, quién se tiene que involucrar, cuáles son los objetivos comunes que tenemos y antes del Plan Nacional de Acción no lo teníamos. Quiero dar dos puntos de ejemplo como una ilustración de esto. Primero, en base a nuestro Plan Nacional de Acción, hemos invertido mayores cantidades de fondos, de fondos eh, financieros, en proyectos internacionales, en sociedades y alianzas, tanto con organizaciones internacionales, pero también bilateralmente con otros países. Y 
estamos tratando de mejorar la implementación de los principios de las Naciones Unidas. Y eso es tanto en desarrollo político y desarrollo de corporaciones. Entonces, el Plan Nacional de Acción fue como el, el, el motor para identificar los proyectos de resoluciones internacionales donde queríamos invertir dinero. Y entonces, digamos, el último ejemplo que quería principal es eh, lo que Alemania ha hecho para las Naciones Unidas en el trabajo de eh, empresas y derechos humanos en cuanto al de, décimo aniversario de las Naciones Unidas. Perú ha logrado a, adoptar este Plan Nacional de Acción en este punto de tiempo y yo estoy convencido de que esta tendencia de mayores asociaciones en relaciones internacionales, tanto para la implementación del Plan Nacional de Acción en Berlín, va a continuar. Y la segunda ilustración, este mes, en junio del 2021, el Parlamento Alemán ha adoptado una nueva ley sobre obligaciones o eh, diligencias para las empresas de derechos humanos. Y muy pocos países en el mundo han tomado estos pasos hasta el día de hoy. Y desde nuestro punto de vista, la nueva cadena, acto de, eh, de, de vida diligencia de la cadena de suministros de Alemania es uno de los mejores pasos que hemos tomado. Hoy día hablamos de planes nacionales de acción. Yo quería decir que la nueva ley de debida diligencia de Alemania es una consecuencia directa del Plan Nacional de Acción Alemán y su implementación. Porque nuestro Plan Nacional de Acción establecía un mecanismo de evaluación y nosotros dijimos, bueno, hay que ver cómo es que realmente se toma la debida diligencia de las compañías de una base voluntaria, porque así es como comenzamos en el 2016, una base voluntaria, y va en base a nuestra evaluación vimos que no estábamos contentos con el grado de la de implementación de la debida diligencia, y en base a estos hallazgos que estaba eh, basado en el Plan Nacional de Acción Alemán, nuestro, gober nuestro gobierno y nuestra canciller, eh, la señora Merkel, dijo que en nuestro contexto un enfoque voluntario no era suficiente. Y entonces nosotros pasamos a una eh, debida diligencia de derechos humanos obligatoria. Y es un efecto tangible de nuestro Plan Nacional de Acción. No se puede hacer una traducción automática a otros contextos, obviamente, pero espero que esta contribución desde nuestra perspectiva alemana les pueda mostrar que el Plan Nacional de Acción puede tener un efecto en las políticas porque le brinda a la sociedad y al gobierno una plataforma común para poder conversar, debatir, decidir cómo es que los estándares sociales se pueden mejorar en nuestro, nuestras actividades de negocios. Y entonces eso es lo que yo tengo que decir por el momento. Gracias. Very much, Olga, for your participation. And with this, we conclude this first round of a Q&A of the answers to these first questions. And then we also have some questions from the attendees today. And I would like to post the second, the questions for the second round, starting again in the same order that we established before. Then Frauchi, then Umberto, and then Olga. And we would like with Frauchi to start about uh, the interest that was posed in the invitation uh, that we had as part of the OECD and the importance that the national contact point has. Our uh, NAP, our Peruvian NAP has involved this national contact point in the content. And in that sense, we would like to know what are the good practices that we can take advantage of in order to also strengthen the work that is going to also work with other factors of the national contact point based on the experience that you also know from other countries in the region and from the OECD. Thank you, Frauke. That would be your question for you. My question, uh, the question for Umberto is, how do the experiences evolve on governance to for the uh, 
effectiveness of the plants in the region in Latin America? And how much does that effectiveness bring to the wide participation? And that is something that has been highlighted, the wide participation that was um, implemented in this Peruvian plan. And then the logic with implementing this plan in terms of results, the participation, how is that a factor in uh, possibilities of more, is it more complications uh, for the plan and the results that we want in the plan? And with Olger, we have some questions that we've we've gathered here. We want, we want to kind of summarize them because they're based on the Peruvian experience, but we would like to take advantage of your reflection based on the German's perspective. And one is, has to do with the importance of uh, the regulations that are being adopted based on due diligence and the care for the environment. How does that impact the results in taking care of the environment? We can also base this on a question based on oil spills that happened in the Peruvian Amazon. And secondly, there's also a question that is linked to the situation in our public policies and human rights based on the special protection groups, one that is most interesting to us, which are people in mobility situations and the refugees. And my question was if in the German National Action Plan had you incorporated any content related to the situation, the refugee situation, which I, I think also happens a lot in Europe and in the environment of this plan. Uh, those are the questions that I wanted to pose. So you have three minutes, uh, Frau Humberto and Holger, to give us your ideas or some reflections. We start with Frau again. Thank you. And they have a national action plan. Uh, it's a national contact point. There's a lot of experience now in national action plans and the role with contact uh, national points. So there's an articulation and three different axes. Uh, the promotion, access to reparations, and then the link with other government agency. And the role, for those who don't know, the mandate for the national contact point is on the one hand to promote the business lines and the responsible business conduct in the country and second of all to work as a mechanism not and those are two very important axes and that are also reflected in the plan in that sense then and promoting the national contact point is a very important um, part of the implementing the plan to promote the tools, standards, and practical orientation, not just with the business sector, but also uh, with uh, leveling the knowledge in all the different interesting par interested parties. So promotion is the first important axis with the articulation of the National Action Plan that is recognized in the Peruvian plan. The second one is the access to reparations. The national uh, contact points, as I said, constitute a uh, mediation and conciliation are problem. Uh, and then they also talk about the business com uh, framework with the different interesting parties. And then it's the main mechanism with non-legal char character in the state that has the specific mandate. And it's important to be widely known for everyone and so that it has clear procedures and that is why from our standpoint in the OECD, we are supporting the national contact point in Peru to strengthen the competencies and we celebrate the interest that took to a peer evaluation in 2022. So the second thing that's important is the access to reparations. And the third point would be the linking 
to different government agencies and acting as a political coherence actor. The national contact point based on the mandate and the specific knowledge on the responsible business conduct can represent, and we see that in different countries, uh, a link to facilitate the different institutions and the political policies that converge in the national action point. Specifically, it's relevant when we try to support and uh, other ministries that would like to support the access and the actions in specific issues. For example, when we mention public purchasing and state companies and the investment and commerce policies. And this also talks about the advantages of the national contact point that is located in Peru, specifically the agency for promoting investment. So this would be my response, Edgardo, of the three different axes, promotion, access to reparations, and coordination and government governance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Umberto, you have the floor. Thank you, Edgardo. The question on the experiences of governance and the broad participation is not a simple answer. But I would like to stress that if uh, something uh, as permanent and uh, the uh, Peru and Argentina, Mexico, I don't have enough uh, uh, information in Ecuador and uh, Brazil. And, uh, but if something has been the characteristic under the different uh, sectors of uh, society, I think it's been very positive. In certain uh, countries, it has been more intense on terms of engagement of uh, civil society and others of the unions. Uh, but it is a good reflex that uh, this uh, broader participation is something that is happening. And this uh, speaks about a dialogue of a uh, social and um, level that uh, did not ex happen uh, 10 years ago. So it is a very interesting ind indicator. I also see that uh, the different uh, just, uh, parties, uh, some eight years perhaps, we thought that we spoke, that we thought about having a national uh, plan, and uh, that's it. And uh, we thought, and where should the uh, national plan had to be directed, and uh, the had to have a focus on uh, transparency every time. Well, perhaps in Chile's case, uh, there's a little bit more and more uh, insistence and transfer and who's corresponding in the country has to do a uh, management issue. And we see that uh, how this plan that you have adopted a couple of weeks ago is more focused on uh, due diligence uh, with the foundational criteria, due diligence in all senses, explanation and orientation on the state, on considering as a legal tool and in the sense of considering as a basic criteria in any uh, criteria uh, action of the uh, co country or the government as economic actor. This is a very uh, clear uh, direction. Uh, we will see how we are orienting the next uh, plans in Mexico, Argentina, and the other countries. Uh, the uh, redress is uh, very important. Uh, perhaps in uh, the uh, uh, Chile, it was that, that this would go up uh, escaping this action in Buenos Aires. It was uh, the same uh, response. Uh, pl action plan is uh, totally different from the judiciary. We have seen how we are incentivizing uh, the role of uh, the national contact focus point and also the uh, uh, judiciary, but uh, with this emphasis uh, to work, it has to be thought about with a uh, standards or law reform. And also another characteristic uh, that is specific to the region, in a certain way, uh, at least it's my perception, there is a very insistent position from certain stakeholders uh, to set into practice uh, the uh, guiding principles. We have a discussion in Europe, but the uh, discussion is centered on advancing on the major stakeholders and the binding binding part in our region in Latin America, we have a lot of opposition even in the politic and public policies and it's something that uh, calls attention as an outcome of these uh, experiences of our governance and also the entry to the questionings and to this insistence and trying not to go so uh, further 
forward, but to give our baby steps, but also the importance of building some from uh, the bottom up, and that is what is the action plan, all capacities with all the actors, but especially with the public sector for capacity building. And uh, these uh, some specificities in Latin America have been revealed, and we have to take it into account for the next plans in the region. Thank you very much for these ideas, and we give uh, the uh, floor to Olga. Olga, you have the floor. Bien, dos preguntas para mí. Una, la primera en la relación en nuestro uh, plan de acción nacional y sus medidas en cuanto al medio ambiente. Más exactamente, lo que podría ser una contribución para la protección uh, del medio ambiente del área amazónica, ¿correcto? Perfecto, gracias. La relación entre los derechos humanos y la protección del medio ambiente es un tema que eh, ha sido que ha estado en la agenda de nuestros plan de acción desde su inicio. Y hay una relación clara, obviamente, entre los derechos humanos y la protección del medio ambiente, porque obviamente hay cierto número de derechos humanos que no pueden ser llevados a cabo sin un, una protección al entorno o al medio ambiente, como por ejemplo el derecho a agua limpia, el derecho a la alimentación o el, agua, o el derecho a un medio ambiente saludable y sostenible. Entonces, cuando nosotros diseñamos nuestra uh, ley de debida diligencia de la cadena de suministros, lo que hicimos no solo fue referenciar a un número histórico de derechos humanos fundamentales en el mundo laboral, tal como el derecho a tener una remuneración digna o a la prohibición del trabajo forzado, sino para decir que las empresas alemanas desde el 2023 también tienen que asegurar que con sus actividades en escala global no comprometan los derechos ambientales y ahí los pusimos. Y esto fue bastante intensivo como trabajo, especialmente en lo que se refiere a sustancias tóxicas como eh, mercurio y el uso del mercurio cuando tiene que ver con llevar a cabo uh, trabajos con uh, residuos uh, peligrosos en la Convención de, Basi de Basilea y lo que son los uh, contaminantes orgánicos persistentes. Pero cuando vemos específicamente al tema de deforestación, por ejemplo, que es un uh, tema en el contexto del área amazónica, hasta ahora, el, la ley de la debida diligencia no tiene una especificidad aquí, pero cada vez que hay una conexión a lo que son derechos humanos, por supuesto el medio ambiente ahí juega un papel importante, pero debemos decir que la Unión Europea, la Comisión Europea está preparando una ley específica para asegurar una cadena de abastecimiento limpia en cuanto a deforestación y estaremos muy felices de llevar a cabo en esta legislación específica de a las uh, Unión Europea. Eh, ya ven la dificultad entre las dos leyes, pero eso está en nuestra agenda, obviamente. En cuanto a nuestro plan de acción alemán, nosotros podríamos más bien trabajar sobre esto. La segunda pregunta sobre refugiados, entendí, y muy buen punto, y de hecho muy punto, un punto muy profundo en cuanto son nuestros desafíos. En nuestros planes de acción nacionales, obviamente tenemos 
una perspectiva sobre nuestros desafíos nacionales, por ejemplo, cuando tiene que ver con uh, temas de explotación, cuando se toma el tema de uh, remuneración básica o mínima, como se dice. Hasta ahora en nuestro Plan Nacional de 2016 hay un uh, tema específico de la integración de refugiados uh, que todavía no ha sido puesto en marcha. Pero debo decir, como lo dije desde el principio, implementar la, eh, estas uh, UNDPs es uh, un proceso continuo y ahora hemos hablado de nuestro plan de acción revisándolo para ver cuáles son los desafíos, los grupos vulnerables que hay que necesitan mayor atención hacia adelante, también en nuestra arena nacional. No he visto la, el nombre de la persona que ha hecho esta pregunta, pero ciertamente ha tocado un punto que debería ser parte de nuestras uh, discusiones nacionales alemanas en la revisión de nuestro plan de acción nacional. Muchísimas gracias. Last question, a more general question for all three of our guests. And it is uh, how important do you consider that it is for the effectiveness the partnership between uh, the governments that implement uh, plan, action plans uh, with international agents, uh, that is, these alliances of governments with international agents, uh, like uh, Frauji for organizations, international organizations, in the case of uh, Humberto, with the academia and civil society, international academia and civil society, and for Holger, the relationship between governments, uh, that is uh, a relationship that would link us uh, from our, that, those experiences uh, with a national plan. I would like to have in two minutes all your thoughts. Thank you very much. Let's uh, start with Frauke. Thank you, uh, Edgar, great question. And I'll also thank you, uh, the other uh, speakers for the interesting answers. Uh, these uh, question the alliances with international organizations. Uh, I think that uh, there's uh, two important issues here or topics. Uh, first, uh, that uh, what we hear every time more is that there's a lot of confusion in the world on what is the uh, uh, responsible business conduct? Is it uh, for social responsibility? You have the objectives of the sustainable development. You have a lot of uh, acronyms, and now you have a, a soup of all kinds of letters that uh, the companies finally don't understand. What do they expect from us? And I think that uh, what is very important right now and all that is a partnership with international organization is uh, to speak with one voice on what is expected from the companies, from the businesses. And finally, all these international instruments, uh, this OECD, ILO, United Nations, be all aligned and completing one another and with common elements to explain the object, the importance of uh, the business responsible conduct, uh, which is for all companies, not only for the bigs and the large ones, but uh, to, uh, the whole uh, chain, uh, supply chain. And so it is important in this partnership to uh, search this coherence on uh, speaking with only one voice and one uh, speech with uh, to the businesses and also in the second place. And I think it is also part of this panel and it is a uh, precisely the best practices uh, that other countries uh, do have. And uh, precisely that is a uh, one of the major functions of OECD. And as I mentioned before, we have 23 of the 25 countries in the world that have a plan that adhere to the guidelines. And in our work group on OECD for uh, these uh, business uh, responsible conduct, as a Peru is also part of it, we have exchanges uh, many times a year on different uh, subjects on the responsible conduct uh, uh, business responsible conduct, and we can also speak about different uh, public uh, policies and different economic areas, and this helps a lot on uh, doing this exchange. Thus, uh, 
would be my two uh, points on uh, partnership with organization, international organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Frau Heide. It has been a pleasure to have you on panel. Now we will go to with Umberto. Thank you, Edgar. A very interesting question. And I think that there are three main roles to stress here. First, the alliance with academia that can give us a clarification on the contents on the legal and political frameworks and the options to go forward in that sense. The academia role has to be not only new not necessarily neutral, but objective on the possibilities of uh, the different uh, governments uh, and uh, stakeholders to advance in this clear form with certainty in all senses. So that is fundamental when you think about how a government would seek to add other uh, stakeholders to develop this kind of initiatives. I don't know what is a civil society, the relationship can be complex, especially in Latin America. I think that it is very important to stress that it is fundamental to have, that there is a constant demand on performance on the government and the private sector without that engine of the civil society. It is very difficult to go forward in different environments and public policies in uh, uh, Standard frameworks and in questions such as judiciary. And I would like to highlight the role of the private sector. In many occasions, I have also had to uh, highlight the possibility of the private sector to transform realities positively or negatively. It is thanks to the private sector that you have innovation, that you have technological advance and progress. And the question here is how to achieve from the government a clear partnership with the private sector to further actions so that are addressed or accompanied to have a responsible business conduct that is a reality in practice, not only on paper. And the challenges to achieve these balance and the government to have this clarity on how to link with the different parties and different stakeholders and uh, what would these uh, different stakeholders would demand from the government and how to respond to the challenges of these interactions. Thank you very much, Umberto. A great uh, salutation to where you are and uh, we expect to continue coordinating. Holger, you now uh, have the participation of Germany and the possibility of have a, a national plan in Peru has been fundamental. We would like uh, to think on how we continue this partnership that has been so successful. Thank you. Okay. La cooperación de Perú y Alemania en esta área es un ejemplo de una cooperación muy buena, muy exitosa. Desde el inicio ya hemos ayudado y queremos continuar a ayudar a trabajar juntos en un logro como este. Para nosotros es esencial ver que la implementación de estos alineamientos de, nacional, de Naciones Unidas sobre Derechos Humanos y también los alineamientos de la OCDE debe ser un movimiento global porque al final de cuentas es hacer que la economización economía globalizada sea más social, más justa, donde no haya un solo país pueda al final, ningún país al final puede hacer esto solo, no digo nada más un solo país pueda, sino ningún país debería hacerlo solo, porque esto al final, si esto no es un enfoque de participativo, puede terminar siendo algo como proteccionismo. Y quiero asegurar y hacer muy claro que en nuestras perspectivas sobre los estándares sociales y globalizaciones, que queremos asegurar que eh, haya un comercio libre y reglamentado de una forma uh, igualitaria y eso es importante uh, internacionalmente, tanto como bilateralmente en una discusión de cooperación, de asociación. Y debo decir que las empresas alemanas que son exigidas por estas nuevas leyes de debida diligencia de mirar a su cadena de abastecimiento global 
necesitan la asistencia, la ayuda de los gobiernos, tanto del alemán, por supuesto, sino también la cooperación de los gobiernos donde están, por ejemplo, están comprando materia prima, minerales, y yo debo decir que todos los gobiernos que gestiona como el Perú o que logra como el Perú establecer una política muy buena sobre em, empresas y derechos humanos en la conducta responsable de la empresa es condición para ser parte de la economía global porque asegurar que los estándares sociales y los derechos humanos y los estándares de medio ambiente es una es la herramienta que abre el comercio, que abre la puerta en la división global del trabajo a la división global de los bienes. Y eso es esencial entonces que sea parte de eh, las empresas y los pueblos, tanto las empresas y la gente en Perú como las empresas y la gente en Alemania, como lo que lo recibamos como un desafío común y que nos ayudemos unos a otros a cumplir realmente con las expectativas puestas por los principios de las Naciones Unidas y los lineamientos de la OSD. Yo sigo mirando hacia adelante con la cooperación con ustedes. I would just like to, um summarize some ideas that were expressed in this roundtable. We are celebrating the 10 years of guiding principles of human rights. And on that framework is how we have managed to finally, after two years of intense labor, you've been a witness to that. Uh, we finally have our national action plan on business and human rights. And obviously, there's an agenda coming in guiding principles that has now put together all the coherence uh, policies of responsible business conduct and are going to buy, be a, in, entail some joint efforts, especially in the Peruvian state. And I wanted to highlight the efforts made to achieve wide participation that has also been commended And that also happens in different scenarios in Latin America. And it needs to continue to be the way to work with the implementation. And in this event, we have also tried to include all of the representative voices. This morning, we haven't been able to have Lizardo Galbert with us, who is one of the most important representatives of the indigenous organizations. And it's not because he didn't want to, but it was because of um, situations that extend beyond his uh, willingness. But all of these actors are part of our process, now thinking ahead into implementation. And we have had a very good experience to diagnose common problems, for example, something that has also been highlighted and something where uh, the OECD has had an important role in detecting and assessing the levels of impact that the informality, informality has in the country. And it's a consensus as a diagnostics in the problems that we have in economy, in the Peruvian economy, this problem with informality, and that has been a consensus. What needs to happen now is how do we adopt the necessary measures and the actions that need to also be in consensus to face this problem in a post-pandemic world. The informality is a key element that is part of the consensus and a key term for what is coming now when it comes to implementation are the due diligence policies. Uh, our guests today have agreed upon emphasizing due diligence and it couldn't be left out of the proposal that we are presenting to advance with our NAP and the contents that are related to the good practices that in many cases have also been um, mentioned by different countries and uh, different companies in the countries but how can we 
to think about uh, informality as, as a problem? How can this involve the the small and medium businesses and considering policies where thinking ahead gradually within this logic of supply chains, small and medium businesses are a lot. And we have also shown that a lot in the report that was shown in 2019 on public policies in responsible business conduct, they are part of our agenda. They are key to our agenda. The good practices in big from big companies have to be highlighted, but we cannot forget the problem that is presented from the civil sectors and from the unions. And there, the most vulnerable groups also are part of the agenda of the sustainable development objectives in 2030. The questions that were posed by the attendees today, um, they have highlighted about most of all questions of labor loss, and those are contents that we need to face in the framework of this plan, and the concern for the most vulnerable groups in terms of the uh, economic aspects, they feel that they also require state responses. So with this, I would like to thank you for being here with us today. And this is how we're gonna close this first panel. I am going to hand the floor over to my colleagues. We can continue with the next panel. Thank you very much, Frauji. Thank you very much, Humberto. And Olga, we'll see you soon. Have a good day. We would like to thank the General Director of Human Rights and all of our panelists that were with us in this space, and also the people who present pose their questions during this panel. Before we start the second panel, we would like you to see these videos that were produced within the framework of the National Council Against Discrimination, important messages that we need to take into account to strengthen the protection and culture of respect to human rights in Peru. Racial stories are being shouted at the woman to ask her to move. <laughs> These same words were used in a comedy program that was issued to a national level, and we didn't learn the right lessons. Racism isn't funny. Esa es una jugadoraza. Pero esa ya no es amateur. Porque para jugar cobra, pese hermano. Pasó la matriz cobrando y eso. ¿Cómo estamos? Le dicen Puma Carranza. Porque levanta mucho. Puma Carranza, ya porque sí, pues sí. Me aguanta todo bastante. Seguro que todo bien, señores. Así no, bien, más está dando nomás. Así pongue, así pongue, así pongue. Bonita, ya no es amateur, ya. No es amateur. Es para jugar cobra, pues es más. Los were used in a comedy program. In TV, we'll learn. Transphobic remarks for another woman. Quiero ser hombre. Esa mano me va a salir. Ay, 
Mire. ¡Te voy a matar! ¡Te voy a matar! ¡Mátame! ¡Quiero ser hombre! ¡Quiero ser hombre! ¡Eh, mátate! ¡Eh, mátate! ¿Ya ves? Dice ya. No era tan difícil. Pues tú enchechó, mamá. Quiero ser un hombre. Gracias. A continuación, Coming up, we will start the second panel of human rights, competitiveness, and productivity, and opportunities for sustainable. All right, we will hand the floor to Mr. Germán Saram, focal point of Center of Organization for Cooperation and Economic Development for Responsible Business Conduct in Latin America and Caribbean, who will moderate this panel. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How is everyone? We are uh, waiting a few minutes. To get Gabriela Canesemnos online. I think there's an echo from the interpreter. I don't know if it's just me or if it's everyone. We have an echo from the interpreter from Mawahun. I don't know if um, we can fix that for this panel, please. Okay, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I think we can still hear the echo from the interpreter and it's a little confusing. I don't know if there's a way to um, fix that, please. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to this conversation of human rights and competitiveness and productivity opportunities for sustainable development in the context of this uh, first National Action Plan on um, human Business and Human Rights. My name is Javier Germán Sarama. I am an analyst for uh, OECD for the development of uh, business conduct, responsible business conduct in Latin America. I welcome to David Barrela Marche, the official for economic affairs from the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean for the United Nations. We also have Ellen Bronski, the director of the Department of Business and Human Rights of the Danish Institute of Human Rights. We also have Alejandro uh, Alexander Toledo, who's the director of uh, Pro Inversión of Promotion of Private Investments, and also Gabriel Amaro, the executive director of the Association of uh, Agrium Product Products in Peru. And we'll thank everybody. And this uh, forum talks about opportunities and significant changes in business in this last few years. And what we are trying to do is have a competitive environment, a productive environment that it also focuses on human rights. What we have been trying to do in this forum is to, in the last decade, we've talked a lot about, the, especially the adoption of 2018-11 from the guidance from the nation. nation United Nations and also for the guidelines for multinational companies in the OECD. And we have tried, started with some different initiatives in the multi stakeholder levels and then also from public policies and elaborating and adopting national action plans for business and human rights. We have also been in an unprecedented period in widening markets and interconnectedness 
where many companies have adopted to development through creating jobs, transferring technology, transferring knowledge and abilities, both from origin countries, from also in host countries. And also day to day, we keep uh, seeing that many companies have um, left these principles and standards behind from the international tools, maybe to try to get a, an undue competitive edge. And this has been seen mostly in environments where the political, regulatory, and institutional frameworks are not very much instituted or are very fragile when it comes to responsible uh, company business rights. And so generally, both the formal and the informal sector can be have a better, um, have more adverse impacts and if they're not done responsibly. Nowadays, it's also widely acknowledged that these standards of uh, business and human rights and responsible business conduct are an essential part of an investment environment globally that is open and that promotes opportunity and competitiveness, especially in emerging markets. But also when it comes to access to these markets, especially considering the productive productor countries like in Latin America and that we talk about due diligence and human rights is more and more a uh, conduct requirement and as was discussed in the previous panel and throughout this entire forum there are many initiatives especially from European markets so that the regions and the productive countries uh, production countries in Latin America can ensure this competitiveness factor and they can export to these European markets, but always complying with these standards and to show that they are the, carrying out a responsible business conduct and they have due diligence in social matters and environmental matters, both in their operations and in their supply chains. So with this brief context, I would like to start posing this uh, first interventions on how can we tackle these um, challenges and these opportunities and then considering the experience of all our panelists from the different organizations and institutions they stem from like the national action plan improve how can this plan contribute to improve competitiveness in the sustainable development of the country so we are going to start if you would like with uh, david barrio please um good morning everyone again thank you moderator german First, uh, on behalf of uh, Ms. Ms. I would like to thank the Peruvian government and the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights, and also OECD, the, uh, the European nation, and all of the other organizers. For us in CEPAL, we see it as an honor to be part of this important meeting. And it's also very timely based on the situation that we are all going through in the pandemic, first pandemic, and because we are also celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Guiding Principles and human uh, from the United Nations. I would like to thank all the panelists and everyone who's here with us. Um, in response to your question, Herman, first of all, I think we need to celebrate uh, the National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights in Peru, and also the elaboration process. The way that it was drafted is as important as the result. From CEPAL, we think this is a very positive step, and we see it as very synergical with the 2030 agenda, with the different multi-stakeholders and other international standards. We also think that the process resulting in this plan and the important commitments that was assumed based on the multi-sectors and the stakeholders and the business sector and other social sectors and due diligence are essential to get to that responsible business conduct that we so crave and that also respects human rights. And the framework of our mandate of studies and then follow up and the support of the company of the region in sustainable development, we have closely followed the development of this plan. And we want to highlight that Peru with this plan is moving forward to a future responsible business conduct. And this doesn't also let us implement these standards in a more effective way in businesses, but they also present important benefits in productivity and competitiveness. They would allow, allow us to have a common framework between different actors and have clarity in the rules. We can close gaps and eliminate asymmetries and market flaws. It reinforces the right environment to respect human rights, which also generates more trust and more stability. And that is why they aim and they present an improvement in 
in the analysis. And in a region like us, where we have high index of social and environmental conflict, conflicts, and there's a high and dangerous rate of threats and intimidations to, for defending human rights, that in, even um, enhances the effectiveness and it commends transparency and legal insurance assurance and to have a better environmental plan. And these plans avoid different types of um, conflicts and they support the sustainable growth. The plans in and of themselves are not enough. They are based in which we construct. And as such, we need to have also a legal and political map that is also robust, coherent policies and a real commitment from all the different social sectors to move forward in the same direction. And we see the plan as the first step that needs to be reinforced, needs to be developed, needs to be implemented to generate the desired results. Also, the plans for human rights and business are also important in this times of pandemic because they contribute to lay the foundation to have a better recovery. In order to understand the, the, the role that these plans have, we need to cons understand that, uh, the context of the reality of where they're going to be implemented. And it's a reality that is very complex. We have many different agents. As you know, COVID-19 has generated social, env environmental, and market imp the impacts that are unprecedented, and they bring new um, stepping stones to develop. And it was already shown that Latin America and the Caribbean are the most um, affected region in the emerging world because of the pandemic, and because that's because of the characteristics that happen in our country, the structural gaps, the legal um, aspects, less social production, a high level of informality that was mentioned in different sessions before the productiveness that is very low. And it also many different significant difficulties when we want to implement policies that can mitigate these effects and can have a sustainable economic reactivation that is also inclusive. Before the pandemic, the rich already registered a low economic growth of 0.3% in 2014 to 2019. And we didn't even reach that in 2019. And that low growth in 2020, then we also have the lack of demand, both internal and external, that we had because of, were a result of the uh, quarantines and it's a closing of some uh, productive activities. But also, this uh, also meant to the worst crisis that the region has experimented in the last 120 years. It's been a drop of 7% of the regional uh, PVD. And then we also have the high, the, the growth in all of the different um, pollutants, and then a reduction in the growth that affects the most vulnerable populations. And we also have a productive structure that also mentions what I was talking about. We have more challenges based on productivity, both on diversification, the modernization of technology and innovation, but also the strengthening the growth of micro and small and medium enterprises. The high growth of productivity then conditions the possibilities of improvement of international insertion of products of more added value and generate the well-being of the population. And faced with this reality, that business and human rights also have a, an important role because they change the patterns of behavior and they also have an added value. Well, the pandemic has shown is that no one in and of themselves can face their own consequences. And then also the um, human, social, and uh, emergency cannot affront the, our climate change in our society. We cannot generate competitiveness and productivity in a sustainable fashion if we don't consider the environment, the rights of people, etc. So that's why these pro problems, these plans, like the one that Peru has just mentioned, uh, presents a platform of collaboration and allows to design ways to prevent, to respond to the different challenges that are being presented uh, currently. Thank you, Germán. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your contributions and uh, see how this uh, 
can be the opportunity that is very important for a sector that is fundamental in the society with all these actors and the groups of vulnerability groups and therefore the action general. And certainly this is the most important issue to design and implement these instruments of policies. We will continue now with... Helene, that is uh, from uh, Sweden, and uh, the advantage uh, of this uh, virtual, and uh, welcome, Helene. And uh, you have uh, the floor now for uh, giving us uh, the uh, your reflections. So thank you very much, uh, to German, and thank you for the opportunity of uh, being able to To congratulate uh, Peru for the adoption through a decree on the action plan and also in Peru is the third country in Latin America to have uh, the uh, plan uh, action plan for business and human rights. You might know that uh, the Human Rights Institute, uh, uh, Danish Institute, uh, promotes uh, this action plan as an essential instrument uh, to implement uh, the uh, guiding principles of the United Nations on a business and human rights. We see that after 10 years of uh, adopting this uh, sector, we have 25 uh, countries uh, worldwide that have a plan addressed uh, to business and human rights. And you can read more about the development of these plans uh, worldwide in uh, the webpage that we have that it's uh, called the globalab.org. And uh, we would like also to state uh, that uh, from our standpoint, uh, uh, the uh, plans are essential as well for uh, to accomplish uh, the sustainable development uh, objectives as uh, was mentioned uh, by David a minute ago. As you know, the companies have an important uh, role on uh, the Agenda 2030 to support a sustainable development. Uh, and an analysis that we did uh, demonstrate uh, that over 90% of uh, the uh, sustainable development objectives are linked uh, to the international instruments of human rights. And also that the fundamental contribution of the companies or the businesses to this agenda is the respect of human rights and estimate uh, that uh, today the transmission to a more sustainable economy offers uh, economic opportunities for the companies as well. So it is part of uh, this transition as uh, could be an advantage for the companies. Uh, with the support of uh, the DACNIA, the Institute has uh, documented how the civil society was involved in our process in Peru. And in uh, this respect, we want to highlight uh, the willingness and the efforts made by the government to prepare the baseline and the plan with the participation or the engagement of uh, a um, number of uh, stakeholders are the voice of all stakeholders. And in this case, as uh, Peruvian civil society unions and the indigenous people is an element that has to persist and even uh, broaden in the face of implementation of uh, this uh, action plan. On uh, this regard, we think that it is important to maintain uh, uh, the involvement of uh, women, which is very important. Uh, and I see that I am uh, the uh, woman in the panel, but uh, uh, we expect to have the uh, as a priority the in inclusion of women uh, as uh, workers, indigenous women, etc., in uh, the implementation of the plan. As uh, the same token, the opening of uh, the business sector to enter these discussions and adopt the measures uh, that demand respect of human rights in their activities uh, seems to be very important. Uh, the plan may be an instrument to help a dialogue at a national level, but also at a project level. And uh, in a country that has uh, many social and environmental conflicts, I think that this plan might also help uh, to have a dialogue uh, with the communities and the uh, businesses to reduce these conflicts. And as you know, conflicts are between communities and businesses sometimes uh, cost 
very much. As you know, there is a uh, trend in America nowadays uh, to uh, start the NAP action plan. Uh, the Colombia adopted the second, the Chile is developing the second. And this is a very interesting example on how a public policy in terms of uh, and matters of human rights are continuous even after a change of administration, as well as the responsibles for the ministries and responsible of the preparation, uh, the development, and uh, the implementation. Uh, Ecuador has started the process of a national plan, and uh, Mexico and Argentina have expressed their willingness to a restart, uh, we could continue a process of uh, the uh, business plan. So, so this uh, action plan. So uh, Peru is a leader in the region in terms of uh, human rights, and that can also be an advantage. Of course, uh, this is still major challenges uh, to have uh, these plans uh, become effective to diminish in the practice the abuse in um, uh, terms of uh, human rights in a uh, global and uh, economy with the uh, value chains that are very complex. In general, the uh, access to redress is very weak and for that, from the Institute, uh, we would like to inform you that uh, we will be working to reinforce the non-governmental mechanism to access it to a redress and with the support of the Project CEDAW and the Ombudsman in Peru and Colombia, as well as the Prime Minister's offices of these countries that we will be working to identify the best practices and the improvement opportunities in the case of business and human rights. And finally, I wanted to say that we see at a global level that the most recent plants have improved their quality. They're based on an analysis of the situation and the top touches on the difficult topics. I wanted to congratulate Peru, especially because the plan states concrete actions with very specific indicators in matters of uh, extractive industries, uh, defending uh, advocacy of human rights environment, as well as attention to the role of the government as an economic agent. Uh, additionally, the plan in Peru includes a mechanism of uh, monitoring that uh, seems uh, interesting uh, to assess uh, how this plan would have a concrete effects, what concrete effects this plan might have. And I would like to share some examples of other countries where we have made some final assessment, but as we don't have much time, maybe we can leave it for the second part of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. Very interesting. You're contribution on uh, the importance of the plan and also the importance that you mentioned uh, that we had on all sectors and uh, also to continue on uh, the implementation and uh, the importance of a plan as a tool and this tool to try to reduce uh, the conflictivity in terms of uh, social environment topics. And we will now see a more perspe national perspective, domestic perspective on what was the development phase and uh, what could be the implementation phase. And we have now Alejandro Prieto from Pro Inversión to tell us uh, on uh, the key of uh, the promotion of competitiveness uh, that this uh, national plan, action plan uh, represents in Peru. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Herman. I would like to express my, start my uh, participation, giving uh, the warmest welcome to, uh, uh, from uh, Rafael Ugasa that unfortunately was not able to be with us uh, this day. And I want to thank the Ministry of Justice and congratulate the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights for their invitation to participate in this panel and this forum that ends the first 
national plan on the business and human rights. I think that this is an event that is very important. We can generate a dialogue space on uh, the different stakeholders and uh, that uh, considering uh, the objectives of PNA and uh, the uh, guiding uh, or principles of the UN uh, would improve uh, or re strengthen the agenda. The first contribution of uh, the national action plan has been in the evaluation of the same. Any planning process that needs a diagnosis and analysis to understand what is the situation we find ourselves in, in this case, and what is a human rights in the different sectors, to then develop the different action lines that would lead us to the result that we want to reach. It. Having said that, having made this in a multi-actors round table with a very broad participation of representatives, we see that we are all aligned on where we are starting from and where we want to get to. And the uh, government in general and from Pro Inversion in particular, we try to bring about uh, private investment to uh, close a gap in different sectors, infrastructure gap in different sectors. And the pandemic has generated a sense of urgency and there's infra social infrastructure such as hospitals, education, uh, uh, sanitation, etc. But uh, the investment that we seek, so our investment of uh, world-class uh, businesses uh, that have in included in their culture the responsible business conduct and uh, with the uh, PNA we are working uh, to uh, put the basis out so the business uh, understand what we are looking for in our country. For example, we can see a mechanism of follow-up, monitoring and voluntary report uh, and uh, the business uh, due diligence mechanisms, which is fundamental for our sustainability of investment. We will have this mechanism that allows us to make more transparent the business actions, especially as it was mentioned in the, those sectors with the social conflict. If we add the follow-up of social commitments, uh, uh, engage in the dialogue process, attention of conflict and uh, the uh, uh, NAP, uh, we can uh, build up on the sectors like mining and hydrocarbons, uh, uh, these uh, possibility that have this characteristic of social conflict. In uh, Peru, the informal sector is very important and it is even more obvious during this pandemic that we are going through to prepare a guideline uh, directed uh, towards uh, the micro and small businesses uh, to promote their formalization will contribute enormously to the solution of this problem. It is a very ambition objective, but uh, that is very necessary for, to help with the productivity and conflicts in the country. We also have plans such as the competitiveness and productivity plan that has 84 measures that are very concrete on the long, short and medium term to implement sustainable the well being of all Peruvians. Uh, this comes uh, from uh, the joint efforts of uh, the different entities of uh, public sector, uh, private sector, academia, and civil society, and uh, worked uh, by technicians uh, produced uh, by the National uh, Technical uh, Center of the Ministry of Economics and Finance. Uh, but this uh, plan on uh, productivity and the competitiveness as the other plans that to look at for sustainable, sustainable development of the country needs a framework for the conduct, uh, the, for the responsible business conduct uh, and uh, that has to engage all the ministries and agencies that are uh, relevant uh, with a more committed and visible engagement from the companies in the implementation of the action plan for businesses and human rights. The implementation of the national action plan can be a platform to guide them to fulfill a pro-competitiveness uh, agenda from the government as well as from the private sector to generate a cooperation to improve the quality of our public policies oriented towards uh, the sustainable development and uh, public uh, uh, policies that focus on human rights are the sum of efforts between companies, providers, academia, and civil society and government in the context of the implementation of this uh, um, NAP is uh, once again uh, the major opportunity to further the uh, policies uh, that are online with uh, the competitiveness and productivity to uh, achieve uh, successful goals. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Alejandro. It's, uh, uh, we see that uh, all that has been uh, signaled under the NAP and the context of pandemic demands a responsibility that is very important and what is the implementation, but also the opportunity to uh, incorporate this uh, approach, especially when you speak about the recovery that is required as a key factor. And this platform can also be serving as an orientation to the sustainable of competitiveness and productivity, sustainability of competitiveness and productivity plan. And so thank you very much for your contribution. For this first round of intervention, we will finish and close with Gabriela Amaro, who is with us and uh, represented uh, for the agriculture uh, guilds uh, of uh, Peru, that is more sectorial perspective, to comment what has been uh, the uh, challenges uh, to uh, the for the implementation of the plan. Gabriel, you have the floor. Thank you, Herman, for the invitation. I uh, Welcome and uh, know the assistance of this event that is very important, not only for the event and the uh, subject, but the effort that uh, the country and all the uh, stakeholders have uh, made and civil society, government and guilds and uh, unions are to contribute and have a national plan. This concept of uh, business and human rights is linked to this uh, responsible business conduct that is basically uh, describes uh, the responsibility of uh, the businesses uh, to develop their uh, their activities in an ethical way uh, with people as well as with the environment, which should not go against uh, the competitiveness and productivity development of the con of the businesses. Uh, it should. Uh, on the contrary, further, it, that is what we have been looking for the private sector together with other uh, uh, stakeholders and during this uh, preparation process. And it is also important to stand uh, and uh, to pinpoint that uh, the government and the business society defense are stewards of human rights. And as is acknowledged by the, human, uh, the United Nations, all people and institutions that are uh, fulfilling and uh, the advocacy, uh, uh, making advocacy for human rights uh, from uh, private institutions, public institutions, agencies, and individuals that work in uh, the areas, in the regions, in the different departments and uh, local communities. Uh, that is uh, done daily, uh, for example, by formal companies, uh, formal businesses, uh, from uh, the modern agriculture sector, especially uh, that is uh, developing their activity in the rural areas where you have the most vulnerable population uh, when uh, where the indicators, the social indicators uh, require a more presence of uh, the government and formal activities. Uh, in these areas, for example, where the agricultural modern and formal sector has developed their activities, it is obvious that to see the uh, poverty, the generation of uh, the generation of thousands of uh, uh, good jobs with all the labor rights and uh, having access, uh, giving access uh, to all the citizens that did not have access to a formal uh, job before and also to uh, disseminate uh, the uh, formal jobs uh, and mainly and throughout their environment. The major issue that we had in our country has the origin in the informality levels of our country in general and the economic sector in Peru, 80% more or less is informal. It is there where you have the structural issue but that informality is not born out of nothing. It is the product of a series of uh, public policies that are not the right ones that have entangled the population and the economic and uh, stakeholders into a part that is not the adequate for a country that wants to develop, uh, which is precisely this informal uh, sector. And uh, the government and the uh, private sector, we are engaged with the country to solve this problem. From the private sector, we have recovered at least nine points in the last uh, 20 years from this activity of uh, modern uh, work in the country uh, towards formality. 
uh, this has to continue, but it has to go in hand uh, with uh, adequate uh, public policies uh, and efficient uh, regulation to help all these population to go from uh, informality to the formality of the economy. And it is there where the people are standing. That is where the people develop their activities and look for their sustenance and where they should have all labor rights and all the dignified uh, treatment according to the topics that we are dealing with today. I... That is why we have to look for with this, the most uh, urgency of this. Uh, and the private uh, companies have to be considered uh, as strategic partners uh, to achieve this objective and to fulfill the basic uh, rights uh, of uh, the human beings and workers. And how the plan can improve uh, the competitiveness of productivity and the uh, Develop and sustainable development is, is very important. This plan is very important because it highlights the importance of human rights in all economic activities. However, to be able to have a significant uh, impact, the government has to make action, take actions, tackling, for example, the construction and the improvement of a public policy. that would target this very deep levels of informality that we have in a labor market and to differentiate them from that formal part, uh, that e formal economy that is a partner for this objective. To be more competitive and more effective in the dissemination of formality, you have to strengthen the legal security and the long term to improve a regulation that hinders this possibility to access to the formality of this 80% and diffi making difficult the possibility for to get, become formal millions of a small and a micro businesses. We have to reinforce a private pr pr property and reduce the risk of becoming formal in the balance between an informal activity to define if they continue to the informality or go towards formality. This balance is this stuff has to be, uh, the scale has to uh, go towards the lower risks to become uh, uh, formal and uh, have more incentives uh, to keep being formal. This does not happen. Informality has increased in the last years and even has uh, gone even deeper and more importantly because of uh, the pandemic in at least 10 points. We have to simplify the government and its uh, bureaucracy and guarantee an environment that would allow the formalization. Uh, this is some important element that would diminish those very high levels of informality in Peru. When you, when you visit other countries, such as in Europe, for example, it is not even uh, thinkable to uh, find a government in Europe uh, with that in level of informality. It is not sustainable. So that is one of the major issues, the issue in which we have to engage everyone, and mainly the businesses are that uh, develop their uh, activities in the agriculture uh, areas uh, and that work formally. Moreover, we have uh, to use uh, this national plan, uh, continue perfecting it, uh, adjusting it to the development of the private activity that you know is in markets that are not even competitive. They're ultra competitive. And if that market, you lose competitiveness, you get off the market. And also that the result and that the company gets off a market, those that suffer is not only the investor, but the worker, it's himself, him or herself, because they lose their possibility to having a job. So that is why it is important that as the world evolves, uh, the knowledge evolves, uh, the good practices and best practices evolve and positive global practices of businesses evolve, 
It is also important in the world to develop at the same speed and perfect the plan. The plan cannot be static. The plan has to walk and according to the evolution of the world and the evolution of the need for competitiveness of the countries and economic agents. While we have these conditions, uh, while we push the cart in the, the same uh, effort for human rights and the effort uh, to keep competitiveness in the country, we will be able to have concrete uh, outcomes and results and we can revert uh, this uh, structural issue that we have in the country today. More than ever, Peru needs solving two major issues that attack directly the human rights. One, the issue of public health originated by this global pandemic of last year that has shown a series of issues in the management of public health in the country and that unfortunately we have a very high number not only of contagion but also of, the, of deaths and also we have to solve the issue of the economic crisis that we have in Peru nowadays. Last year we had two digits in negative on economic growth decrease of almost 12%. So these are two fundamental topics that go against everything that we want to protect, which are human rights. And where the country needs, and the Minister of Labor has said it, uh, last year in June, July, we have lost almost 6 million jobs in Peru, thousands of uh, uh, companies that went bankrupt and businesses that closed where we have to make a job, a work, a very coordinated work between public and private sector to recover the attractiveness and that trust in Peru to bring a private investment and to make the company sustainable. Not only small businesses, and uh, but also the big businesses. It is a full ecosystem for development. And that in general, no, not in general, that are the sole source of uh, wealth that we have for the country's uh, source of wealth and source of employment uh, and that is important uh, to have uh, the approval of this plan on the one hand but with these concepts uh, that we have mentioned and that uh, we have been disseminating in the different workshops that we have had for example today peru is another 65th place of 141 countries in the world in the major indicator uh and the major indicator of uh, productivity. Uh, the challenge is enormous, not only for the public uh, sector, but also for the public sector. But we have to solve this issue of competitiveness in Peru. The plan has to be made an element to empower this uh, competitiveness and to help generate more private formal employment. And to end, in the case of uh, the agricultural sector, we have developed, uh, we developed our activities in the most vulnerable areas. 57% of the economic activity on the rural areas is due to agriculture. Imagine the challenge that we have in the sector on what is the inclusion or the incorporation of this 80% of uh, informality to the agriculture formal activities, especially because it is a strategic activity in the countries demonstrated in the pandemic that we are living through and where the very few essential activities that did not stop during the pandemic was uh, the productive and uh, uh, chain of a trade uh, of agricultural products uh, for national domestic and international markets because finally it is part of a global chain. That is why the role of uh, formal agriculture uh, businesses is a guarantee of human rights in the, those areas that are the most vulnerable. We have the we have engagement of our companies in the whole sector to continue furthering, improving, and uh, uh, pushing forward the human rights in the country. Thank you very much.
thank you, Gabriel. That's uh, a lot of challenges and opportunities that you were mentioning. And also we consider that having identified those uh, key sectors on the economy, it's also uh, represents the most pop vulnerable populations and it represents a challenge, but ultimately an opportunity because this national action plan is not going to be able to solve structural problems like um, informality. But it's a plus platform to start this uh, conversation that is very relevant and to start to see what are the mistakes or what are the role that the formal companies can start with this due diligence. And as you were mentioning, to consider the role of the SMEs, which is something that Okay. At the beginning, it's a challenge to involve the SMEs that need to have an important role in that sense. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, we're going to go now to the second uh, and final round. So I would also I want to ask our panelists in that space to round out their consider final considerations. We're going to have four or five minutes maximum per person. And we will start with uh, David with specific questions, especially from the experience in Sepal, what will be a coherent focus in public policies in terms of responsible business conduct? What do you think should be the priorities that the state should assume, and especially SMEs to contribute with the sustainable development? And what are, could you mention some successful comparative experiences that may serve as an example for Peru? Thank you, Herman from Sepal. We have been, uh, we have a long standing tradition of studies then trying to look at a more sustainable uh, development uh, and that lower carbon footprint and trying to get to the goal, to the zero goal. And that's just an effort to not leave anyone behind, those groups and people who are more excluded and more marginalized, not only in the economy, but also to exercising their rights. And also, we require, aside from what was mentioned before, not leaving anyone behind, is more and better integration, both nationally and regionally. Why not just to improve productiveness and competitive competitiveness, but it also can generate better value chains and better productive um, associations. We think it has to be transformative in response of the crisis and the structural problems of the region, and it's to be able to integrate the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, society, social, and environmental. There needs to be a structural change of decarbonization and the technical progress with the quality of rights and opportunities. That will be the key message of CEPAL. But the priorities that we propose from the states and the different social and productive states are focused on a combination of policies to close these gaps. And that's what we've called the brain drive for sustainability in three dimensions for the business and human rights companies can notably uh, help. Competitiveness is first when the um, innovation and the production of technical processes is used within that structure and that competitiveness shows that the specialization pattern can change and can lead to sectors that are a little bit more dynamic, both technologically, environmentally, and socially, and that reinvent the effective demand, both nationally and internationally. We cannot do the same things and expect different results. And just to give some examples of good practices of summary of those sectors that have been dynamic and transformative, I would like to quote um, eight examples that because of time, I'm not gonna be able to uh, expand on all of them, but just to have an idea of the base, based on our analysis and the experience shared, what are some of the aspects or guidelines over which you could work in this plan for business and human rights can contribute. First is the energy transition, renewable energies and the loss and the reduction of fossil fuels. Renewable energies are in opportunity for the economic recovery have been fast, inclusive, and sustainably. And the benefits that it would bring, not just in energy safety and environmental benefits, but also it would allow to develop a sustainable electrical grid that allows regional interconnection based on renewable energies that also can generate jobs. We have calculated that if we support this trend, the energy transition, we can generate more than 7 million qualified and non-qualified jobs up to 2030. And if in the region we opt to produce and, and manufacture these uh, and that is aimed to renewable energies like solar panels, etc., 
we could generate an additional million jobs. That is just an example. The other sector would be sustainable mobility in urban spaces in Latin America and the Caribbean is a region that is highly organized. As you know, 80% of the population lives in urban areas. So there's a great mobility, great demand for mobility of uh, housing and urban planning. Electric mobility also offers an extraordinary opportunity for the automobile industry and, the, and multiple social benefits and environmental benefits. And we have examples of manufacturing of automobiles in Brazil, and Mexico, and Argentina. We have important reservations of coal power that base the primary base to contribute to the sector, high uh, big areas for solar energy and wind energy. And we can also produce and generate and export hydrogen to low cost in a sustainable fashion. The third sector, sector would be the digital revolution. Again, to, granting access is one of the most uh, challenges in the region, especially in the world of COVID-19. Uh, welfare is not going to be possible without the digital governance. And we need to promote that equality with inclusive projects that can lead to the digital transformation, can drive digitalization of companies that can also define privacy and security of data and respecting the rights of all people and also economic, social and labor rights. The fourth sector would be the manufacturing industry and health and in technological sophistication, which was also mentioned before by Gabriel, the importance of dedicating the health sector in order to have a sustainable recovery. The fifth one would be the uh, economy based on in natural ecosystems, which is one of the main strengths of our region. We need to take advantage of this potential in our economy that is abundant. It's not valued with much when it comes to the availability of the ecological and the biological resources that we have. And this could contribute to diversify the productive diversity to increase the value sustainably. And for example, transitioning towards agroecology or developing value chains and diversified organic um, harvest that are originary from the region. The sixth sector would be to value and expand the economy of care, both in care that is done in work uh, market and non-paid, uh, unpaid, like for example, housework and members of the community, and we need to incorporate that in the structure and drive it in such a way that it can be counted, it can be paid, and this affects, as was mentioned, mainly women uh, in a market that employs 75%, or women contribute 75% to this uh, market. The seventh uh, sector that I would like to call it to attention is circular economy, where we need to decrease the uh, resources that we use and to increase the way, use of waste. We don't recycle as much as other regions, and then paper and car and waste and plastics and, and glass. So there's a great potential to use a circular economy in local uh, supply chains and also in managing residues and recycling. And we can generate jobs. They have direct uh, links to the sector, direct consequences that would allow that if it's a key activity in the economies in the country, in the region, the recycling rates can also be an engine to reactivate the economy and generate also 450,000 jobs as we have calculated and we increase 0.75% the GDP in the region and also sustainable um, recovery of the tourism sector. We are a region that gets in the space not only internationally, but also locally in, uh, tr in tourism, where we have important elements of biotourism, ecotourism, that we also offer as one of the elements that can drive and then bring the situation after the pandemic. So uh, they need to be privileged in the political industries and the technological industry, and they show the importance of finding a coherent focus in public policy when it comes to business, responsible business context. Uh, if we can have a few minutes later, I, I can say later, or I can say now, basically we need to break this uh, this gap between human rights and economy and investing human rights. And it's not only an imperative that is moral and ethical, but it's also a smart investment. It's profitable. It brings returns economically and environmentally, and it improves our competitiveness, productiveness, and jobs. And 
the action plans that channel these changes and can also be in favor of the companies and it favors the new capabilities and place them in a more strategic position, more dynamic position to face the challenges that we have ahead of us. Thank you, Herman. Thank you, David, and your examples. All of those are sectors that are very innovative, if we could say that, when it comes to considering the national action plan. So we know that the Peruvian action plan is also interesting because it talks about a lot of the considerations that you mentioned, for example, when it talks about energy, renewable energies and health, etc. And we talk about circular economies, it's also very relevant. And it's an important component that we saw they were asking in the audience of them, um, how do we tackle these uh, differentiated impacts in gender and the vulnerability, the condition that women are in different aspects of the economy? And I think that the plan has presented some very interesting st strategies. Thank you for that, David, and your final remarks. Uh, we're going to go now to Elin. I would like to also talk about this uh, question. I don't know if Elin, you want to tackle it or any other panelists about vulnerability and gender issues that are also important to tackle in this plan, specifically from Ellen and your experience in the Danish Institute of Human Rights, especially specifically as you said, to work alongside governments and other interested parties in developing these public policies and strategies on um, human rights. Uh, what would you say are the main challenges and the main successes that you've had in tackling this from a voluntary focus and the political focus but also thinking about this role that we need to have about regula regulatory tents. And then this company agenda of the working towards sustainable development that also can tackle the adverse and impact real and potential from this complementary focus on what's comes from voluntary, that transition that's going to a more regulatory framework. Yes, the uh, principles are based on a smart mix or, or, um, or smart, a uh, smart mix of voluntary measures and mandatory measures, so that I can guarantee we can guarantee the respect to human rights when it comes to economic activities. But what we are seeing is that most of the national action plans up till now have focused on voluntary approaches. For example, in training and for companies and dialogues, but we see now, 10 years after the adoption of the uh, guiding principles, that there are more efforts in terms of regulation being done. And I think that with the pandemic, the calls to economic uh, redress or the economic recovery is sustainable are even stronger, louder. And now from Europe, we can see a lot of initiatives in terms of regulations. For example, uh, the National Action Plan in Germany, they announced that if the measures in the plan weren't effective for companies to improve their behavior to change their conduct, we could they could adopt a bill to regulate that conduct. And they uh, did an analysis that concluded that most companies, most big companies in uh, Germany, didn't pay enough attention to human rights. And as was mentioned in the first panel, uh, a week ago they adopted, uh, they passed a law to require the businesses to show their due diligence in terms of environment and human rights. France was the first country to adopt this law. In the Netherlands, they adopted a law on due diligence in matters of child labor. Norway also last week adopted a law of due diligence that was very ambitious and the European Union is now developing a legislative proposal that we hope that will be ready for the end of the summer. What that means is that the big company, European companies, are going to be forced to verify that the stand human rights standards are respected in the supply chain 
and they will need to be it's a very really difficult course for me. They're going to have to demand their uh, financial partners and their suppliers to respect human rights. So the Peruvian uh, companies that provide the supply to the European market, for example, in agricultural products or mining products or others, are going to have an indirect impact, uh, but they will still have an impact based on this regulatory framework. The good news is that based on the issues that were posed in the, the National Action Plan, the Peruvian companies are going to have the opportunity to understand the importance of respecting human rights. They're going to have the support of the state. They are going to be able to open a dialogue with social civil society to identify the impacts and improve their practices. And they will be ready for these uh, demands that they are going to be seeing shortly. I think that as also uh, David was mentioning that investing in human rights is a smart investment. It can be a competitive, it can give you a competitive edge to the Peruvian business people. Last week, uh, the United States also announced that they would um, Re, redesign their, their NAP. There's no process right now to regulate the American companies in terms of human rights. There is an important turning point for companies that they cannot ignore human rights. So there's a global movement that has been started in Europe and I think that it's a very a timely moment for Peru to take the necessary measures to be ready when these regulations are going to be put in effect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aline. Very complete and very interesting. And there's a global vision on how this uh, is evolving in uh, these uh, uh, instruments that are binding and non binding, and also in the fact that uh, the action plan represents that opportunity of being able to align with these expectations that come from the market and from the trade partners that are working on what is the trade and investment issues in Peru. Connecting to this, I would like to give the floor to Alejandro and ask Alejandro perhaps from the standpoint of Pro Inversión, which is also the contact and the key issue to be on the public policies on the responsible business contact and also to see, uh, make easier the access of redress and all those mechanisms of uh, this very important mandate and uh, what is the role that they can have uh, on uh, the national action plan. Thank you very much. Remember that in the after the study of public policies for responsible business conduct in Peru in 2020, it assigned the action, the pro inversion, the focal point on the business conduct to promote the directing guidelines and the due diligence for the responsible company businesses. That is why it uh, con considered uh, that uh, the PLC Peru could be important for the development uh, of uh, the action plan on business and uh, human rights in Peru. The articulation in uh, Peru and the national action plan on business and human rights is started with our participation and the support in the job and uh, the preparation stage and uh, formulation of uh, the plan and the multi-actors uh, Roundtable and the executive. In the implementation of the plan, the 
uh, focus point or contact uh, focus point is an important uh, challenge and the starting of this new uh, stage of uh, the uh, PMC activities uh, to choose the coherence of uh, the uh, public uh, measures and uh, the agencies responsible of human rights. For us as a PMC, we are oriented uh, to uh, have awareness on the different uh, sectors on uh, due diligence and understanding that uh, the human rights as due diligence because uh, we have to have a process and through which the businesses can identify, prevent, uh, mitigate uh, the impacts, uh, ad adverse uh, impacts, uh, real, actual, and potential to these their operations. And what is the facilitation of access to the development specifically on the specific instance of the uh, function that we have as a PMC is to be a facilitator of the dialogue between the parties and uh, to promote dialogue and uh, to further the uh, reaching of common agreements. Uh, we do not uh, take any position uh, there and as uh, Eileen uh, said in her, her first intervention in the context of the different uh, disciplines of uh, the uh, business uh, responsible conduct that we have as a uh, participating with the TLC as we would have in June uh, the uh, state uh, government uh, capacity building for matter of uh, business and human rights uh, with uh, the uh, participation of the Danish Institute of Human Rights with help by the TNC to acquire knowledge of uh, best practices in this matter. Also with this, uh, we can do a uh, exercise and uh, different uh, for the different sectors. Uh, as a final comment, I think that we will start now. The most important part, which is the uh, um, Implementation of this plan, and for that, it is important to have the engagement of all parties and the different responsibilities for this plan. And what will be obvious is that the engagement that we have is in the allocation of necessary resources to be able to implement all the activities that are considered in the plan and to achieve the goals established and the cases that are indicated. And not only we have uh, resources of the government, but also very important uh, for multinational and uh, big and um, major businesses won't have issues with that. But the smaller businesses uh, will have uh, to make an additional effort, especially uh, considering that uh, if you want them uh, from uh, the big companies as the mining companies uh, uh, to place uh, these uh, topics, uh, they would need uh, to invest. And we would see a way in which uh, we should uh, facilitate this access that I think will be a process that will take uh, some time to be able to come to uh, fruition. And finally, and uh, I think that the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights has this major challenge of articulating all the efforts of our bodies to achieve a follow-up uh, uh, with the support uh, for the international organizations that are with us, the OECD, the ILO, to complete and make this plan more concrete. And from now on, you have the engagement of Pro Inversion as one of the major pillars for your help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. And I uh, see in this uh, intervention uh, the fact uh, that you give uh, this uh, plan as a uh, public policy, a uh, government public policy, as your quality of uh, government official to do this uh, recommendation of articulating the medium and long term as well. And in the case of uh, the prevention PNT, to see how it is a reinforcement of competitions uh, that has uh, become a progressive literature that would uh, go over to the long term. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, reaching uh, the end. Let's uh, finish this interesting uh, discussion with Gabriel. And for Gabriel, we would have a question that is very punctual. And 
and this uh, diagnostic and this assessment that you did in the sector and uh, the challenges of the sector in terms of concrete actions uh, for the gap. Uh, what is that you think that uh, for these uh, association to have the due diligence uh, with uh, these uh, uh, national action plan? What are the areas of uh, attention to the problems that you think that are impertinent? And also a comment from uh, the uh, uh, audience, uh, what is the impression on the role of the small agriculture, uh, family agriculture, having also Uh, knowing that this implies a series of issues uh, uh, through around the structures uh, like uh, formality and from the gap, what are your considerations on trying to mitigate uh, these uh, dynamics? Uh, thank you very much. Gabriel, you have the floor. Thank you, Germán. A very broad answer, very important. I would like to to start uh, highlighting what Eileen said on the demand of the countries uh, that demand from the businesses of the due uh, fulfillment of human rights and throughout the whole supply chain, Peru, as you know, and I always repeat it, Peru is not a country of 33 million consumers. Uh, Peru is a, a country of over 7 billion consumers. Why? Because it's one of the countries that is most integrated in the world. It has one of the major numbers of uh, trade agreements with all the economies in the world. And as we are in the Southern Hemisphere, we have 90% of the population, world population that is in the Northern Hemisphere. That is our huge market. A huge market and linked uh, with what was said before, that is the market that is ultra competition and that has a series of demands and parameters so that not only it is to buy a product, but everything that is around this product or related how it is produced. The uh, company characteristics, uh, the impact and they have, the influence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is very important for these developed countries. That is why I say these are ultra competitive markets and they have the formal companies of Peru, especially the agriculture, which is one of the companies that, that is in the sector. As a gap, uh, we have uh, the, in, participated in different uh, public spaces uh, to be able to disseminate and collaborate and uh, present our proposals as usual and to improve the practice This is in the framework of human rights and environment. I got for many uh, years now has a code of conduct. Well, one of the major uh, points uh, that is in where we engage not only the associates, but also the businesses that are part of our guild, it the states as such, harmonization of the legitimacy uh, Business and productive interests that seeks to contribute with a dignified life and sustainable development of a society based on the full respect to human rights. That is one of uh, our major points uh, for acting of the guild and the companies that uh, or the businesses that we represent. And to do so, we have different activities additional to what I mentioned already. And where not only do we have this code of conduct that is a general code of conduct, we have a program, a compliance program, for example, and anti-corruption topics that have been already uh, implemented, a free competition. And precisely now where we are working is a self-regulation model on terms of labor and human rights. Why? Because we consider that it is very important as a topic in itself. It is an additional step that we are giving. And mostly because we have to accompany the country in solving this uh, informality structural issue that has uh, touched 80% of the economy in our country. If we do not solve that, we're not a sustainable country, actually. So this is one of the issues that we're working with, and we have also a agreements that we are about to sign with Sunafil that will be signed in these days that is accepted by both parties. 
and we have a round table where we meet periodically, where we propose a series of actions to improve on the, the informality of the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Moreover, to continue to further the best practices in the sector, as you know, in our markets, a demand to have uh, demand from us to have certain certifications and global certifications on the quality of the product, on the best practices, on processing and production, but also certification in terms of labor, uh, social issues, and uh, human rights. And that we and our companies and our businesses that are audited uh, annually for different certifications uh, to show this due diligence in different aspects, in uh, amongst which a labor uh, environment and uh, human rights, uh, we will continue. We are one of the few institutions of uh, guilds uh, that have uh, uh, the world, uh, the global gap uh, mandate for the technical group uh, uh, that is uh, Regenisa, which is the certification of good uh, practices of processing and agriculture, and also in labor uh, social issues, uh, CRAS, for example, we have uh, the uh, charge from this inter international institution to disseminate this uh, best practices, accompany our businesses in uh, training and good practices, and to have every time more companies that can uh, be including these best practices practices and uh, their daily uh, work. And uh, some times ago, and uh, not uh, as far as two years ago, we signed up uh, with another uh, certification, which is a WS uh, for all issues that have to do with uh, uh, dissemination and uh, joint activities on, on glass and this also, we have the rector uh, principles of human rights. For example, we are the major sector, employing sector. Uh, the ILO acknowledged already that 30% of uh, the global uh, productive uh, uh, population uh, works in uh, agriculture. In Peru, it's not so different. It's 25% uh, uh, of Peru that uh, is in agriculture. We're the major employer in Peru. And with uh, this uh, modern and formal agriculture uh, development that we have had in Peru, over 50% uh, that we have this statistic to 2015, it was a 4016. And now it's over 60% of uh, women are uh, working with on our sector informally with all their labor benefits in formal businesses. We are furthering a training uh, workshops on human talent for these uh, businesses. All of them have a seal and uh, of, uh, businesses free of child labor amongst other things. And also to f further some actions with citizenship in the areas of influence of our businesses. We have seen this uh, in the last year of pandemic where many people lost their jobs and uh, people that died that uh, families needed uh, support and also the uh, public uh, institutions in charge of health services and our businesses through Agapsu, through CONFIEP, we're part of CONFIEP, we have supported with the donations for different institutions such as beds, uh, ventilators, uh, personal uh, protection elements. Uh, we have gone to businesses uh, to disinfect the streets and uh, to help uh, donating food stuff and donating um, Mask and to do train as a gap, but we have uh, done uh, 
training at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we were one of the first ones in Peru and globally to have uh, the manual of uh, prevention and uh, best practices against COVID-19, especially on uh, this guarantee and the requirement that we have on inequity and safety, uh, food safety, but also in the health and safety of our workers, of uh, uh, the different uh, businesses and environmental issues. Uh, we have also uh, certification uh, blue zone and uh, the uh, water uh, works and uh, the taxes are for uh, works and uh, on um, used water treatment, we have accepted the invitation of the Environment uh, Ministry in Peru for this uh, Pact for Circular Economy in the country. We are very committed with environmental issues and the different certifications that we have furthering. Also issues in education, we are supporting some rural schools for the education of the children. We have also some publications on helping the children on uh, reading comprehensions. Uh, we have uh, a, a storybook that is called uh, El Maíz en Sorgo that helps on uh, uh, humanitarian aid. And uh, we have other actions so that's uh, uh, the sustainability area in Agapa that will be in charge of issues uh, such as uh, furthering uh, pro uh, products of by for taxes, uh, uh, circular economy issues, environment certifications, best practices, and everything that I mentioned uh, before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel. I want to take advantage to thank also uh, to David and Alejandra and Elina. Thank you. Very interesting panel. We have a lot of challenges in front of us and many opportunities in implementing uh, this plan and also and the participation of the Minister of Justice, not only the technical team, but the whole team uh, for the Gerardo Rodriguez, Federico Chunga and the multi-actor roundtable that have accompanied the process. We want to congratulate the Ministry for the space and this forum that we have uh, felt the very fruitful. Thank you, the whole panel. And we continue now with the rest of the session and the forum. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Germán Sarama and the four panel members that have been with us today, as well as our people that have presented their question during this panel. We will now have uh, the third panel. The labor rights and public policies on uh, business and human rights, the role of unions, and we will give the floor for Ms. Cecilia Tello Guerrero. She is the Director of our Promotion and Protection of uh, Fundamental Labor Rights of the Ministry of Work, uh, Labor, and uh, she will be in charge of moderating this panel. Thank you very much, Jimena. For me, it is a pleasure to be here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Everybody participating on the third panel, uh, the labor rights and the public policies on business and human rights, the role of the unions. Before presenting our distinguished panel members, I would like in the first place to thank the Minister for Justice and Human Rights that made possible the organization of the International Forum Public, uh, uh, public Policies and uh, uh, Guiding Principles of First Action Plan of Human Rights in Peru, as well as acknowledge uh, the effort of all the officials of the sector of uh, justice and human rights to further this process of um, this uh, plan, the same that was prepared in the framework of an open dialogue and active uh, listening that promoted uh, the en engagement of the different sectors, such as uh, the executive and uh, the employers and the workers and civil society as a uh, 
whole, which allowed to reinforce the content of the document. And not only that, but to uh, have a consensus and approaches that are so necessary to be able to further our national policies in the most effective way. Having said this, allow me to present the distinguished uh, panel that is with me today, amongst of which we have uh, Corinne Vargas, which is uh, the director of uh, the Standard uh, Department in the ILO. Uh, good afternoon, Corinne. And uh, we have also uh, the Luis Isarra Delgado, who is a Secretary of Defense of the Confederation of Workers of Peru, the CGTP. And also we have uh, Madam Paola Guzquiza-Granda, which is Secretary of Defense of uh, the Autonomous Central of Workers of Peru. Good afternoon, everybody. Panel members, before starting, allow me a recommendation, general recommendations. First, uh, please uh, respect uh, one, one minute before uh, finishing your first uh, round. I will remind you that we are at the end of your time, so you can uh, finish uh, during end time. And after that, to request uh, have intervention to consider uh, an adequate uh, pause on transmitting the ideas to facilitate interpretation of your intervention and also facilitate the translation. And to also further in this uh, exchange time and the ideas and experiences from your experience and your very important trajectory. Without further to further say, in the first round to tell you that you have eight minutes each one. An introduction uh, would have uh, for us very important for and for the public as well to know what is your assessment, your proposals, your recommendations on uh, the potential and the limits that uh, the a national plan of actions of business and uh, human rights uh, has uh, to reinforce uh, the institutionality of unions and their capacity for, through the guiding principles and the standards of the ILO, contribute to build up uh, the conditions of uh, decent employment of uh, workers, uh, bearing in mind uh, the very important uh, informality issue that we are facing in the economic and labor uh, sector of Peru, and also the percentage of uh, union representation in our country and considering as essential the participation and inclusion of vulnerable groups such as women, disabled people, uh, elderly, LGTBIQ, and other vulnerable groups so with you. And to start this panel, I will give the floor to Corinne Varga. Thank you very much and welcome, Corinne. Buenos días a todos y todas. Good morning, Voy a expresarme en, en inglés. Disculpe, I am not speaking English, I'm sorry. Uh, suficiente para hablar uh, fluidamente. My Spanish is not enough to be fluent in it. So switch to English. Uh, first, a big thank you for having invited me to contribute to these critical discussions as you're launching the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights in Peru. This is really an important initiative which will contribute to putting people back at the center of public policy making. So now your question, what are the opportunities and limits of the National Action Plan to progressively strengthen the institutional framework of trade union and their capacity to contribute to building decent employment conditions of all workers? So let me start by addressing the opportunities as I see them first. The National Action Plan does recognize the role of trade unions in the responsible business and human rights agenda. This is really important to highlight as there might be a perception that the only actors in these discussions are governments and enterprises. And this perception might be based on the fact that the UN guiding principles have specific pillars for these two actors, but workers and the representative organization, the trade unions, do play a central role in ensuring that real progress is made towards effective protection of workers' rights, and that this is done based on the enabling rights of freedom of association and collective bargaining. 
So as you might know, the ILO multinational declaration attributes an important role to workers' organization, and it has clarified this role of trade unions, especially in relation to the due diligence process that enterprise should undertake to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address their actual impact on internationally recognized human rights. The m declaration clearly calls for a process involving meaningful consultation with potentially affected groups and other relevant stakeholders, including workers' organization as appropriate to the size of the enterprise. And that process should take account of the central role of freedom association and collective bargaining, as well as industrial relations and social dialogue. Now, my second opportunity that I see is that you have really a good precedent and a solid basis upon which to build. As the ILO regional director said in his opening remarks, we do believe in the ILO that Peru has set an example in the region, not only by developing the third plan in the Americas, but by doing so through a sustained dialogue, which was constructed in a broad participatory consensual and decentralized manner with the business sector, indigenous people, trade unions, and civil society. And I'm really, really pleased to see that the ILO has been able to play a role in providing support to all these important actors in that broad consultative process through the responsible business conduct in Latin America and Caribbean project. So, Building on that positive experience, I see the implementation of the National Action Plan as providing a real opportunity to strengthen the institutional framework of trade unions and their capacity as you engage in the implementation of the priority action identified in the National Action Plan. So my third point is about that. Your national plan has identified among its strategic action the need to promote the ratification and implementation of several important international conventions, as they are the basis for making decent work a reality for all. Your plan talks about promoting the ratification and implementation of Convention 187 on Occupational Safety and Health. This is really particularly re relevant in times of COVID uh, and and ensure adequate protection for, for workers. Your plan also talks about promoting the ratification and implementation of the Migrant Workers Convention. Uh, and this is also uh, something that we consider important in a context where Peru has welcomed a huge number of uh, migrant workers, in particular coming from Venezuela into the country. And it has become really an urgent task that uh, to look, in, to look after these migrant workers so that you can also handle the aspects that touch upon informality, poverty, and discrimination. Then also let me mention uh, the, that your plan touches upon promoting the ratification of the Convention on Labor Inspection in Agriculture. And the very idea of strengthening the control of public and private enterprise on compliance with regulation is really critical for promoting economic formalization, one of the major concerns of, your, of the country's business sector, and is a key element for increasing social security protection for Peruvian men and women. But your, your national action plan contains other important roles. Uh, it, it aims at promoting a change in the culture of trade unions as defender of human rights. It contains a proposal to strengthen the implementation of prior consultation based on the ILO Convention 169 of the indigenous people, considering the development of productive activities in the context of the country's sustainable development. Your plan does also propose to raise the minimum working age to 15 years of age and to eliminate all forms of hazardous work for those under 18. These are all really important commitment being made by the government of Peru, which are indeed very, very much welcomed by the ILO. And I'll finish, and I think I'm within my time, by saying, by using a say, an English say, the test will be in the eating of the pie. 
In other words, much of the promise of the National Action Plan will depend on the continuous and meaningful engagement with the social partners, not only employers' organization, but also workers and their trade unions in its implementation. If this is not ensured, then the National Action Plan will have limited impact on the right holders whom the business and human rights is all about. So this will be my initial uh, uh, con contribution to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karin. And now I would like to give the floor to Luis Isarra to continue with this exchange. Thank you very much. You can go on. Thank you, Dr. Cecilia Tello. Uh, and I, on behalf of the workers of Peru, I would like to welcome everyone in this panel with the director of the Department of Regulations from the ILO. We have two representatives from uh, the trade unions in Peru. We would uh, thank the invitation to participate in these international forums. And it also allows us to say that the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights for the 2021-2025 period is a collective achievement that is very important for our country. And this is why this international event is a, is a great opportunity to reflect on the follow-up and the implementation of the plan, because as was mentioned in previous um, interventions, both in the previous panel and in this one, uh, in the world, especially in Peru, there are a number of plans that have only been good intentions. So we will like to show that the trade union uh, leaders are defenders of human rights and we also produce social development. It's important to mention uh, that for workers, if we don't consider bipartisanship and social dialogue, there is a frailty in the democratic focus. And this is why the Peruvian Trade Union Central uh, participated in this entire process, because we saw that there was social dialogue. And in terms of the National Council of Work of Labor failed. Uh, the National Policy of Competitiveness and Productiveness was, uh, workers were ignored during this uh, implementation. And social dialogue is the basis of democracy and the strengthening of this tool that helps us to all live in peace. And if it is well executed to protect human rights, then it doesn't work. We should not forget that the dependency of human rights tells us that if one right is at risk, the entire framework doesn't work. So generally, the participation of a non-state stakeholders has been constant throughout this process. The trade union uh, centers and social civil uh, authorities and indigenous uh, populations have acted together to find consensus. And this has allowed us to pose different uh, problems that are not labor problems, but are related to it as well. So this process has opened up the opportunity to link the works that we could do jointly looking forward because of all the problems and all the stakeholders have a convergence in the inequalities that are presented in, based on the relations of power. So from the 97 strategic actions that were provided in the NAP, 38 of them, which means 40% of them, are directly related to unions. The uh, complying with these actions is and will be followed up closely by or monitored by the trade unions. As it shows in the NAP, the elaboration and implementation of the NAP based on the guiding principles and other international standards has 
contributed mainly to race awareness and race interests of the different public sector stakeholders, private sector stakeholders, and civil societies uh, because of human rights. Chief among them, labor human rights. Because other uh, public entities are uh, different from Minhus uh, didn't work as often with this uh, multi-stakeholder roundtable, it was something that we noticed a lot in civil societies organizations. And we saw this as a sign of a not a lot of involvement in the government as a whole in the process. Of course, probably this will come into play with the national implementation of these policies. The deadlines of this process were extended more than was expected. And the central idea of this process, the discussion of the actions of the indicators, the drivers, the goals, could only be carried out in a very short period of time towards the end of the process, about the last month or so. So we consider that all of the policies of the state um, should have a comprehensive human rights focus. From trade unions, when we elaborate the goals and the alignments, we have presented some proposals. One of the cross-sectional approaches that we've presented is related to consistency or coherence before, be, between the guidelines and the objectives and the strategic guidelines. For us, this plan needs to ensure the consistency or coherence between ordinance, objectives, and strategic actions. What does this mean? It means that the objectives need to be need to uh, help the uh, the alignments to work, and that these strategic alignments need to work in order to get to our objectives. What does this mean? This means that in order to achieve the public policies, the signs that we want for protection, that we can prevent uh, infringements on human rights, is important to ratify treaties and to promote the compliance of the treaties that were already ratified. So we also need to mention that no strategic objective or action in the National Action Plan refers to this last aspect. Another thing that we have achieved is related to financing and sustainability of the actions. Uh, we need to guarantee that the provided actions have enough financing from the public budget and will not depend, at least not fully, on international cooperation as has happened before. In that sense, we need the associations from the National Action Plan in the public budget, and it needs to be form, uh, formulated as an object, objective in and of itself, or to be incorporated when drafting certain strategic actions. In the NAP text, which shows, for example, in page 59, it says the following, the roundtable of the executive uh, power for the National Action Plan with the participation of the multi-stakeholder roundtable consents the 97 actions with the different indicators and goals for the period of 2021-2025. The revalidation of these actions from each of the ministries and entities that are responsible for this took into account the different competencies and also the incorporation in the different operational institutional plans which is why for the implementation it will be financed based on the institutional budget of the public entities that are involved without demanding additional resources from the public sector if we follow that line the supreme uh, decree that approved the national action plan established the implementation of the action from the National Action Plan from Business and Human Rights 2021-2025 will be undertaken progressively and will be financed based on the institutional budget of the public entities involved without demanding additional resources from the public sector. 
and uh, we to quote to note, I'm going to finish soon, uh, that these quotes indicate that the actions that were established in the NAP will be introduced in the operational plans of the entities that are in charge of implementing it, which theoretically would guarantee the financing. The fact that they don't have to demand additional funds can indicate that the entities will have to restructure their own budgets in order to include any new action that needs to be executed to comply with the NAP. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luis Isarra. And now we give the floor to Paola Guzquiza to listen to her thoughts on the first round of intervention. You have eight minutes, Paola. And that's, uh, and now you're going. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, as uh, my colleague, I am also part of a union sector of the Cent Autonomous Central of Workers of Peru. With the organizations of civil society. I will start our intervention acknowledging the work that has been done for by the five uh, stakeholders for the uh, national plan to be approved. There were some obstacles, but at the end it was approved. During all this process, uh, these unions have had a very active and engaged participation in each one of the documents uh, that we have spoken of. We have given our contribution and uh, our feedback. Although it is not the product that we would have uh, wanted, uh, we think that it is the first uh, a step ahead uh, to uh, for the human rights on uh, labor in Peru. And I would like to speak about what uh, was considered and what was uh, left uh, outside. And I would speak about two topics, uh, the due diligence mechanism and informality on the economic sector. Although it is true that the plan considers as a one uh, item uh, to engage on uh, human rights in Peru, the due diligence mechanisms. Uh, this is an obligation of means, so that is it's conditioned, and I'm sorry, I'd reiterate, to the means uh, that uh, the companies will have and uh, report. And the behaviors are, or the conducts is uh, on a uh, standards uh, that are already existing in Peru or above our legislation. So this uh, due diligence is simply not to fulfill completely on human rights uh, because it is only linked to the goodwill and unilaterality of businesses. Because us as union organizations, what we have proposed is that the due diligence should be regulated by an ILO convention, or by a supernatural legislation, or our collective bargaining. So the best uh, goodwill of the uh, business is to comply with uh, the uh, current uh, legislation, and above it is to sit in that round table and sign labor clauses, and not only for the big and major uh, businesses, but also in favor and uh, the surveillance uh, in them. And that is uh, the uh, mechanisms uh, for due diligence to work adequately in defending the human rights. Another issue that uh, the uh, unions are taking into account is informality. We live in a country where the informality goes up beyond 70%, and currently the pandemic has made this increase. In that sense, uh, we think that the solution is uh, to see policy policies, uh, policies uh, but in a tripartite uh, through an effective and efficient uh, social dialogue with a focus of human rights, as the plan stated. Unfortunately, as Lucho has already said, we had a very poor experience where we abandoned uh, the Labor Congress uh, because we were excluded on uh, the national policy of uh, productivity and competitiveness. But why? Because the major in solution for in to, to cut informality was to cut uh, uh, the labor rights. So that is totally unfounded. And uh, the law itself that has a tenure uh, that has not solved uh, the informality issue. 
Likewise, we consider that it is a very important to have the plan to combat informality and to give access to these companies for its formalization, such as the public procurement system to contribute to formality. But uh, this is a little short on the proposal made by the unions sector. What does this mean? That it's only limited to prefer or give this preference to those uh, businesses that uh, fulfill, according to the 23rd uh, strategic action, the inclusion of measures uh, with the businesses uh, that incur on uh, the uh, forced labor and the worst uh, ways of uh, children of uh, children labor but this is not enough to the violations against the union freedom against uh, the collective bargaining and uh, the fundamental human rights we don't understand and that uh, makes it that that justifies the submission. And uh, thus we have the observations that although have been gathered by the plan that is only set partially, and though these come from the contribution of the union sector. And what is the ratification of a convention? We uh, proposed a minimum convention that had to be ratified, 129, 155, 187, 190, and 104. The only plan only considers 187. The plan also states as a major achievement through the plan the strategic actions and goals that happened before this. So for example, the modification of the list of uh, uh, hazardous work, and these have been worked before the plan for hazardous and forbidden work for adolescents. And the other which is uh, important is that the uh, institutionality, but we in the union sector, we think that this mechanism for these institutions to be able to guarantee the respect of human rights in the administrative and judicial way and uh, uh, before the judiciary. For example, the Sunafil is only for the private sector. And let's not forget that the EU government is also employer and it also Lacks, has lacks of compliances. Who controls this sector? Who controls these workers? And the judiciary is not there, no, but justice gets too late. And we know that when the justice is too late, it's not justice in itself. But um, human rights and human and natural resources, the plan has been prepared through a diagnostic of, uh, of freedom, of a union and collective bargaining that highlights uh, the human rights. The strategic actions on this plan do not take into account the activities as we would have liked. For example, it uh, speaks about observations and gaps so that have to be breached, that uh, we only have it for child labor and forced labor. So it does not answer on the observation by the control of the ILO on the legislative uh, gaps and the need to bridge them through a dialogue. That is uh, not only us in the, the compliance ways of these uh, lack of compliance of the government, The way is the dialogue and also the uh, freedom on uh, union work and uh, no option is, yes, and uh, time is over. And to conclude, it is important to state that we believe in the strategic uh, action 23 in uh, what is uh, the uh, contracts and uh, the observations of ILO, but we always will believe in dialogue. Uh, we have not participated in some spaces because we have not been guaranteed uh, on the convention 144 of ILO because we have not had a dialogue that was transparent enough and we were only communicated of the facts. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Important reflections that we have from the suggestion on what are the opportunities of development and the reinforcement of institutions that we have through the implementation of this National Plan of Business and Human Rights. And to start our second round, uh, in the context of what uh, has already been mentioned by our panel members, I would like to uh, place a question to Madam Varga, Director of uh, the Department of the International Labor Organization, uh, to uh, give us an answer uh, from the standpoint of the ILO for the implementation of uh, the National Plan could uh, contribute in the guarantee of the freedom of association and reinforcement of institutions and the unions as a challenge of the government, but also as an agenda that is required for the uh, union. Thank you very much for this very, very good question. Um, and from the outset, I think I need to acknowledge first and highlight the very robust recognition of freedom of association in the Peruvian constitutional and legal order. This reflects the attention traditionally paid by your country, an ILO funding member, to labor law and labor rights. But as in un in, as in any country everywhere in the world, challenges of course exist, especially with respect to the effective access to and exercise of freedom of association and collective bargaining rights. And just to echo what uh, my two panelists members had said, indeed there are a number of comments that the ILO supervisory bodies have made in respect of Peru's application of Convention 87 on Freedom of Association, 98 on Collective Bargaining. And bearing those in mind, I would uh, argue that special attention needs to be paid in regard first to the possibility in practice for workers with short-term contracts to unionize without fear of negative consequence. This is really important in very dynamic sectors of your economy, such as agribusiness or non-traditional exports. Another area where special attention uh, should be paid is the strengthening of administrative and judicial mechanism to effectively prevent and sanctions act of anti-union discrimination. And the third area that would deserve special attention drawing on what the ILO supervisory system have called for is the promotion of collective bargaining at all levels, not only at company level, but also um, taking into account that um, the existence of sectoral bargaining, so bargaining at industry level, is sometimes the most reali realistic option for accessing collective bargaining rights in certain areas of activities. And um, I am informed that uh, the December 2020 revision of your law on the agricultural sector is quite interesting in this respect. So it seems to me that your national action plan could usefully address these challenges and for instance, one, by ensuring that the due diligence mechanism to be established by companies do contribute to preventing and resolving the difficulty posed by the exercise of trade union rights by workers on short-term contracts. Second, and my last point, would be that you could also use the implementation of your national action plan to ensure that the social dialogue structures of the National Action Plan do provide a forum for the effective promotion of collective bargaining at all levels and do provide a space to resolve the concrete difficulties that may arise in this regard. These would be my concrete proposals and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Varga, we will continue with a question that was addressed to Mr. Isarra. Based on what you mentioned, we would like to know what you think 
to about uh, guaranteeing the union, trade unions from the states the adequate contribution and above all, how can we strengthen the institution, uh, trade union institutionality and collective bargaining, as was mentioned before in this um, panel. Um, thank you very much for the questions. And talking about the first intervention that we had, both Paola and I, we talked uh, a little bit about dialogue, social dialogue. We think that the Peruvian say need to guarantee a binding uh, tripartite um, dialogue. And this does, didn't happen even in the national, uh, the NAP. And we need them to guarantee a tripartite binding dialogue. They need to also guarantee the respect to the freedom of trade union, of collective uh, bargaining and strike. And that's not just through regulations, but to guarantee to comply with the right of this exercise. Why do we need to, to know that the, we have the right to strike when all strikes are mandated as uh, not binding? This not, it's a right. So why do we need all of these laws for common bargain, for collective bargaining if the workers in the state companies are shown the, the decrease of uh, profits through collective bargaining? And the previous state forgets that collective bargaining is a human right. So the state needs to comply without discrimination, with equality, in conditions for all workers that are both public and private. Right now, the companies from the companies from the states, the businesses from the states cannot, should not have, cannot have collective bargaining powers since last year. So why is it, what does it help us when they tell you that we can unionize when every time that they try to do that, what they do is flex the norms so that it doesn't guarantee the freedom of unionizing. Workers consider, as workers consider that they should also inform periodically from a perspective of evolution of how many trade unions were registered in the last, how many trade unions have been uh, closed in the last five years, how many periods of claims and collective uh, bargaining agreements were uh, signed, how many strikes were declared illegal how many strikes were organized. All of this information should be located in the stats from the Ministry of uh, Labor and they need to be available. These indicators are going to allow us to profile more clearly what are the persistent difficulties to exercise the trade union laws uh, or rights in Peru. One of the main conditions that the state needs to guarantee is complying with Article 28 of the current Peruvian Constitution. This means to guarantee the unionizing freedom that promotes collective bargaining as new so methods of Pacific resolve and to regulate the rights to strike. These are human rights that we are talking about because Peru has signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the international treaties that talk about this issue. So that is all that we ask for. I think that we want to ultimately uh, see them have a political will to do these things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Isarra. And now we will uh, hand over the floor to Ms. Paola Uskisa to finish with the second round and the answer to the question that uh, we will pose for you now. How do you consider that the unions can tackle or can help when recognizing and guaranteeing the defense of the rights of popul vulnerable populations and vulnerable groups. Talking about uh, women, working teenagers, uh, LGBTQ populations. And from your perspective, and also from the perspective of the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, how does this open the door to guarantee them and to be able to continue promoting them? Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Cecilia. It's important to note that unions aren't also based on point eight point eight of OCDS. Our union agenda goes beyond that one point. We tackle within our union agenda a public agenda for the country that brings about more topics than the ones that are just related to unions, like social responsibility, inform and informality, and also it's not just about informality, but also within companies. And we also go alongside the eradication of child labor, or the eradication of forced labor. We are in favor of the uh, equality principles and within our own organizations we have uh, generated in our congresses the respect to all fundamental rights and also the right to protection to social security when it comes to vulnerable populations and because i don't have a lot of time i'm just going to talk about women as the trade unions alongside with social uh, civil societies we have formed a group to ratify the 190. We are in favor of this agreement to be ratified. Why do we believe in this agreement? We believe in this agreement because it's the first time that they touch upon violence and harassment in the uh, work environment. And work environment is defined beyond regular work. What is the, the work environment? It's work environment also in informality and other spaces that have not been regular. Uh, regulated before. It also considers some regulations that we haven't ratified in health and safety at work. And it also talks about a harassment as a psychosocial risk for us. So these uh, trade unions, we want to ratify this uh, agreement because it doesn't only benefit women, but also all workers in Peru. Furthermore, we believe we have uh, internalized that the most uh, the best way to work until this agreement is ratified is that within our uh, collective bargaining clauses we incorporate the contents of this agreement until the state can ratify it and this is there's a first step that was done it went from the executive to the legislative we don't understand why the legislative power hasn't decreed to ratify this convention uh, this agreement we believe in this. The, more, the important thing is that women in the union world have they have three different uh, functions. They are workers, they are mothers, and they are unionizers. And in order to guarantee their participation and the representation of women in specific um, functions, they need the abilities and they need the state to promote and to respect what this agreement 56 say in terms of family conciliation. And we also believe that women need to have to be cared for in all the parts of work life with an access to work relations and when it comes to termination. There are certain rules that come within this agreement of 183, but we believe that there should be better, more regulation in companies. We need to look at the diagnostics. How many companies during this pandemic have um, closed their agreements with working moms? Let's see in this pandemic how many people or how many union affiliates uh, we saw a case now of a public uh, claim against uh, Innova Ambiental who have terminated a pregnant uh, worker. And the state is the one who is uh, contractors of the subcontractors that's the municipality of Lima. So we cannot just ratify things. We have to have legisl legislature that comes alongside these agreements and generate the adequate mechanisms to regulate and comply with these regulations, the state needs to be articulated and be coherently uh, working not only to ratify, but also to implement these states. Thank you, Paola. We are now coming towards the end of the second round of interventions. And in order to get to our final round of interventions, I would like to invite the first, um, your final thoughts for just one minute. Uh, we will start with our panelist, Corinne Varga, to hear your final thoughts for two minutes. Yes, thank you. Gracias. Well, my final thoughts, well, listening to, to, to all the interventions in the previous panel, uh, I... I progress it takes two things it makes 
will and it takes to have the means. And I sense that the will is there, uh, the political will, the civil society will, the social partners will, the engagement of the trade unions as we've seen today. Uh, so, and, and this has enabled the adoption of the National Action Plan. Cree ese Plan Nacional de Acción. Lo segundo son los medios. Y lo que yo he escuchado de los otros panelistas es hablar sobre asegurarse que tengamos la oportunidad de implementar de manera apropiada a lo que nos hemos comprometido a hacer de manera conjunta. Y esto lo que necesita son medios, medios nacionales, eh, medios, y estamos hablando de exclusiones, que no solamente hablamos de apoyo externo, sino también de poder tener nuestros propios recursos para poder realizarlo. Desde mi punto de vista, voy a terminar ahí, de la perspectiva de la OIT, nos encanta poder ver este eh, momentum que está creando este Plan Nacional de Acción, y estamos muy agradecidos de ser un socio y de poder apoyarlos, un socio útil en este ejercicio. Quiero terminar asegurándoles que estamos aquí con ustedes y nos estamos, seguimos comprometidos con brindarle todo el apoyo a los proyectos que estamos haciendo desde nuestra perspectiva. Hay muchas promesas, hay muchas en ese Plan Nacional de Acción. Hay que hacer una realidad ahora. Gracias. Muchas gracias, eh, Corín. Y... For the final reflections on this panel. Thank you. Uh, workers here, we are here as workers. We have been present in the entire process that has been almost two and a half years in the making because we have a lot of expectations, we have a lot of hope. Just like the Ministry of Justice has had a very important role in this entire uh, stage, we also want to call upon the other public entities because we've mentioned that there are 17 ministries that are involved, but during the process, as we have mentioned, they haven't been actively participating. Very few instances. I think that now that this National Action Plan has been approved, it's the time for them to be involved and committed in this implementation policy and monitoring policy and that they shouldn't let the Ministry of Justice work alone. There's going to be a lot of um, roadblocks, but it's time to start working. As it has been mentioned before, as, as Paola has mentioned very succinctly, there are many uh, infringements on labor rights. There's a lot of informality in our country. This pandemic has made visible the infringements of rights, the flexibility of work uh, labor laws. And what we hope is for this national election plan to help change in part the situation. We are committed to continue working and we consider that The state also needs to take into account that human rights issues aren't issues that are just based on one ministry or one um, institution. It's, uh, it has to be done by everyone as a cross-section. And I would have to finally uh, thank Dr. Federico Chunga, Jimena Solor Salon, and the entire team that has worked the entire team that has organized and then also ILO and other institutions that have supported and made this possible. We have clearly stated that we have a lot of expectations that have been frustrated in this situation because it wasn't carried out, you know, our proposals weren't carried out, but we will still be here supporting and backing everyone so that this can change in the future. This is a very important first step. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Isarra. And now I'll have the floor to Paula Isisa for final words. Thank you. I would also like to thank everyone. We have lived through that commitment from Mr. Chunga, from Ms. 
Jimena, Mr. Eduardo, that despite the political conflicts that the country was going undergoing, this plan needs to continue and be implemented as a trade union, as I mentioned before. We are very happy to see this first step. We will be very vigilant when complying with this plan so that this plan gets implemented. We believe that just as we have had a collaboration space, that there should have been a multi-stakeholder committee created with agreement to continue following up with this plan or monitoring this plan. However, there was only a space in that but that was only done for the drafting of the plan. We thought that we could generate this multi-stakeholder committee. We hope that this can formalize in order to provide safety to the binding of what the agreements of this committee for all five stakeholders. Second of all, it's important that the plan for uh, business and human rights is implemented, but it's important that both the, the business, the state, and the state as a business can comply with what they are agreeing to. The wills and the due diligence, as, as I mentioned, it needs to comply with what has already been established. And second of all, the pending agenda to close the gaps in our legislature in front of the entire uh, international uh, regulations that the state has ratified. That is the first step to start with a blank slate, and that needs to be complied. We are soon to become sure that health and security at work be uh, human rights and everything that needs to be done but bind it. It's binded to that right. So in the next few years, it needs to become a mandatory right that is not going to have to depend on ratification of any different uh, agreement. So this due diligence is going to become something that is going to be mandatory. That is uh, all I have to say now. We will continue doing this work. And this is something that is we are interested in, and it is something that goes for all of our life for workers in Peru. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of my coworkers. Thank you, Paola. And I need some final thoughts. So I would like to mention some things that I've heard from both Corinne, from Luis, and Paola. First of all, the will that all of the different actors have presented in developing this national plan of business and human rights. We are trying to work on the means, right? That is when I wanted to highlight the participation of all of the stakeholders that have supported this and have contributed to formulating this national action plan. Beyond that, we also are expecting the hopes that we have so that the implementation of this plan that is also interconnected to other state policies and public policies can bring about the results that are that we are all expecting. And finally, to show that this national action plan also presents a multi-stakeholder uh, committee and a multi-stakeholder uh, roundtable with indigenous groups and uh, work groups that are going to be driven from the executive power. And it's one of the first steps in this organization in order to implement it. And that will probably happen in the next few days. Uh, aside from that, we want to recognize that part of the expectations and the comments that were presented today, both from Paola and from Luis, when it comes to being able to work jointly from the state and from the trade unions and work in three parties with the business sector. We are working in different topics at the same time. One of those is, and I think it's something that you can see now is strengthening the regulations in the prevention law and sanction of uh, sexual harassment that is connected to the agreement that tries to face harassment and violence in the workplace. And that is an action line that I am uh, responsible for and that the Ministry of Labor has been very vocal about. 
And another thing that we need to work on that where we have a participation, a constant participation, and with a lot of proposals from our trade unions, is trying to face the eradication of child labor, where a little while ago we developed, we commemorated the position that we have as a country to eradicate child labor in our country. This was an articulated and active work that has it brought a lot of joy of commitment from the different stakeholders that work in the National Committee of Prevention and Eradication of Child Labor. And also in another aspect that was uh, driven jointly with the workers and also with employers. Because I'm sure that there are many things that from the state need to be improved upon, needs to be strengthened. But in order to do so, and as is shown in the reflections of these three members of our panel today, we need to work together and we need to be committed and we need to develop these important instances of active dialogue, of active listening as well, where we can all have and recognize each other in this process of strengthening this process that, need, that needs our commitment and our capabilities of dialogue and tolerance from different opinions. Thank you to our panelists today. It's been a pleasure for me to be a part of this team that was able to present the ideas linked to strengthening the uh, trade union freedoms and the exercise of the fundamental rights from this perspective and also to channel the, expected, the expectations that we have through the implementation of this National Action Plan of Business and Human Rights. I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, meeting, and I would like to thank everyone for being here. Now it's 1.49. We are still here and listening to our comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We thank uh, Madam Cecilia Tello as well as the panel members and the system for being with us on this first day of the forum. We want to remind the, all the public uh, that they will find uh, more information on the National Plan of Action on Business and Human Rights 2021 and 2025 in the webpage of the Observatory of Human Rights, uh, whose link we are sharing in the chat of this platform. We also want to thank uh, for your support board in the uh, uh is this event to the project of responsible business conduct in Latin America and the Caribbean, financed by the European Union and managed by the International Labour Organization, the Organization for the Cooperation and Economic Development, and the Office for South America of the High Commissioner of the United Nations for Human Rights. And finally, to remind you that tomorrow, on uh, the June 25th, we will have the second day on the International Forum that will start also at 8 30 of um, the morning expecting that you would have a great rest of the day thank you for being here with us Recording stopped.